table behind me. But we need
Dear colleagues, good morning. Good morning. Let me introduce myself. I am Hanan Al Ahmadi. I'm the assistant speaker of the Shura Council in Saudi Arabia. It's my great honor and pleasure to be uh, presiding on this session this morning, the, the third day of the assembly. Good to see you all. So we will. Uh, continue with the, uh, our uh, schedule for the assembly this morning. Uh, in the beginning, I would like to uh, uh, say congratulations to Ms. Tulia uh, Axon, Madam President, for her election as a president of the IPU, and we wish her the best of luck. We are sure she will continue the mission of the IPO, IPU uh, effectively uh, for years to come. And uh, we look forward to, to her uh, next years in great uh, pleasure. Uh, we would like to also, uh, we I would like to call on uh, the next uh, country on the agenda, it's Bolivia. Mr. We would like to call on Bolivia, are you here? And next, it will be followed by Montenegro. Thank you. So Bolivia is not here, as I'm informed, so we will continue with Montenegro. Distinguished chairperson, esteemed colleagues, at my first addressing on Interparliamentary Union Assembly, I would like to express how pleased I am to be a part of this worldwide community. These days, I have followed different discussions where parliamentarians express their dedication and commitment to additional efforts on issue of parliamentary diplomacy, trying to highlight the importance of peace as a precondition for any development. The IPU is based on the idea that the dialogue is central to the peaceful resolution of conflict, and I understood that our common goal is to find the best way how to parliamentarians uh, may play the role in the conflict prevention and uh, peace building at the national, regional, and international levels. We live in a world that is fast developing. Unfortunately, this development is not felt equally by everyone. The, um, the price of the past development is also the increase of inequalities, both in development and in developing countries. And inequality leads to discrimination. Discrimination leads to different interests. Different interest with the lack of dialogue leads to conflict. Conflict leads to war, and here we are. 56 states around the world were experiencing armed conflict in 2023. Parliamentary diplomacy can make contribution to the conflict prevention or even solution of armed disputes. Firstly, the lack of strict regulation in comparison to the traditional diplomacy introduced by the governments might be the great advantage of parliamentary diplomacy to make two sides in conflict closer. To sit together and talk. Of course, the parliamentary diplomacy comparing to traditional one 
and does not have such powerful measures to ensure neither it has such responsibility, but it can be used as effort tool, especially uh, at the beginning of ceasefire, uh, prior to governmental steps. Secondly, parliamentary diplomacy has its role within prevention of polarization al uh, along political, ethnic, racial, cultural, or religious lines with, within the society. Foremost, parliamentary diplomacy consider interparliamentary dialogue and cooperation, and parliamentarians advocate uh, democratic values uh, by ensuring the rule of law, uh, controlling the actions of the executives and creating normative framework. It has its tool guaranteed by its constitutions or law to control the government's action on both domestic and international level. On the other hand, parliamentary diplomacy may contribute to governmental efforts in promoting peace and security as added value. We can use different tools to exercise parliamentary diplomacy in that purpose. Apart from this multilateral platform on gathering, uh, each parliament should also use more especially uh, tools on bilateral level as groups of friendship to promote uh, results made in field or national or geostrategic interest. We should be aware of the significance and all the opportunities we have within parliamentary diplomacy. We should encourage ourselves to be as unique as it's possible in advocating the message of peace and mutual understanding. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker is Palestine. Mandou Palestine, or is or is it? So, Palestine followed by Iran. Ah, you want to post Tajil? Iran first, okay. It, oh. So, next is Iran. Efficient, the, the most merciful. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, peace, salam, Ramadan Mubarak, and Nowruz Mubarak. At least 1,000 children have had limbs amputated without anesthesia in Palestine. Let that sink in. Because the same genocidal entity that's been bombing homes, schools, Hospitals, mosques, and churches indiscriminately is also blocking Palestinians' access to food and medicine. Some 32,000 Palestinians have been murdered in the last six months alone, some 72% of whom were women and children. And I cannot bring myself to speak of the shameless crimes in Shifa, Nasser, and Amal hospitals during the ongoing Israeli siege especially the violation of Palestinian women. Of course, far more crimes are committed than we know of, but no journalist is permitted to be present and cover. Both the Israeli regime's criminal actions and the shameless intentions voiced by its tourist officials present a textbook case of genocide, which is interesting because an extensive amount of education has been provided across the world, in great part by the UN, presumably to prevent such genocide. They condemned genocidal actions and promised never again, but it seems like this education was only meant to portray the Zionists as victims deserving to occupy another's land, plunder another's resources, and murder another's children. I, pay, I say, Zionist because we Iranians recognize Zionism as a political colonial ideology that has nothing to do with the Ibrahimic religion of 
Judaism. We have known the genocidal nature of the colonial entity of Israel, and that's why since the very establishment of the Islamic Republic, we stood against this illegal occupation of Palestine. With the insightful instruction of our founder of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Imam Khomeini, we have also held an annual Quds Day in which millions of Iranians march to raise awareness about the Palestinian genocide on the last Friday of Ramadan. As a result of our anti-genocidal policies, we were made to pay a heavy price not only by the Zionist regime's assassination of our scientists and other terrorist operations inside the country, but also by its biggest financial and military supporter, the U.S. regime, which happens to be a U.N. veto holder. Yet, the brave and moral nation of Iran chose resistance in the face of unilateral coercive measures over assisting the Zionist regime in genocide. We are followers of Ibrahimic religions, after all, and our faith dictates that we don't facilitate the murder of innocent people. Of course, one does not need to be faithful to be applauded by such heinous violations of human rights, which makes us wonder where the international organization's task with upholding human rights has been all this time. We witnessed how last year, in the 145th IPU assembly, following the unfortunate death of a single Iranian woman in police custody, the Islamic Republic was falsely accused of killing women. It was then, long before the report of so-called fact-finding committee that we knew we would be wrongfully condemned using baseless reports, the likes of which have always been used to justify sanctions against the, Iranian, the great Iranian nation. And where are such committees to address the Palestinian genocide happening in real time? Do the millions of displaced and murdered Palestinian mothers, children, journalists, doctors, and more deserve a few fact-finding committees as well? Will Western veto holders be held accountable for testing their latest weapons on our Palestinian brothers? Do human rights still matter when they can't assist colonial powers in so-called regime change operations? Clearly not. This is why the US vetoed ceasefire proposals time and time again and recently proposed a resolution that contrary to mainstream media claims only quote, determined the imperative for a ceasefire, allowing the Zionists to continue with the genocide while misleading the masses. This is why we at the Islamic Republic of Iran have always emphasized that peace is impossible without justice, that one cannot run an apartheid colonial regime for decades and demand that the oppressed stay silent. As long as the Israeli occupation, the expansion of its illegal settlements, and the massacre and forced displacement of Palestinian native, natives continues, there can be no, no peace. Today, I am standing before you on behalf of the brave and faithful nation of Iran to condemn in the strongest sense the Palestinian genocide and hold responsible the small and feeble Israeli regime committing it and the U.S. regime that has made it possible. Uh, of course, there conclude? are more officials with Palestinian blood on their hand. Western ones who send thousands of troops and tons of weapons to the occupation. Eastern ones who do all they can to help it break the Red Sea blockade. And UN officials who ignore the plight of millions across the world and Thank merely you. pay lip service to human rights. We need a world where more leaders have the morals and courage of those in South Africa. Only um, then Mr. we Speaker. truly say never again to amputating children without anesthesia. Long Thank live you. faith, humanity, and resistance free Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. Iran. <laughs> Next on our list is Georgia. And I would like to ask all speakers to stick to the five minutes assigned. Thank you very much. We have a lot on our agenda to conclude on this final day. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, considering extremely complex security situation in the world, including multiple conflicts, rapid rise of conflict-related deaths, and humanitarian crisis, 
Peace and international security are the issues of paramount importance that require joint efforts and actions. Parliaments can indeed play a significant role in addressing conflicts and building peace. Nowadays, parliamentary diplomacy is critical to promote friendship, trust, and understanding between countries. Recently, Georgia was granted EU candidate status, which took our relations with you to a new strategic level for which we actively engaged in parliamentary diplomacy as well as adopted important laws and regulations. In the Parliament of Georgia, we put much effort into strengthening the bonds of trust between people and the Parliament through promoting open, accountable and transparent governance. The Georgian Parliament is among the global foreigners uh, to that end. Besides, in recent years, many states are targets of these information activities that aim to manipulate public opinion, distort the trust, and undermine the uh, trust we place in our democratic institutions. We also witness the tendency of attempts to influence particular groups of the society rather than the governments as such. We have to continue fighting disinformation narratives in which parliamentary diplomacy can play an important role. Against the background of global e insecurity, Georgia is also increasingly vulnerable facing high risks for escalation. Russia's military forces remain illegally stationed on the part of the territory of Georgia. In this regard, we are grateful that due to the solidarity of so many of you, UN General Assembly resolution on status of internally displaced persons and refugees from Georgia's Abkhazia and Schinwal regions got the record high supportive votes in 2023. Talking about peaceful uh, peace building at the uh, national levels, I also would like to use this special platform to address the people living in the temporary occupied regions, ethnic Abkhazians and Ossetians, that today there is a principal difference on issues of political arrangement between the societies turned apart by the war. However, we have to solve the problem by peaceful means, and our children will have to live in one geographical space. We need to make sure that they are able to look into each other's eyes and not through the scope of guns. That is why the Parliament of Georgia approved the package of laws with the in involvement of all political parties, which serves to create an atmosphere of trust, including the purpose of developing business relations. From here, I appeal to all internally, uh, international organizations and stakeholders to further support this process. Georgia is also a committed regional actor that promotes dialogue and peaceful conflict resolution in the South Caucasus region. Georgia has already taken steps towards facilitating communications between the neighbors, Armenia and Azerbaijan, contributing to stability in the, reg uh, in the region. All above mentioned show how important parliamentary diplomacy has become establishing new channels of communication. Establishment of friendship groups with other countries and promotion of peace-to-face -to -face parliamentary dialogue are significant tools at our disposal that can be used robustly to achieve our common objectives. Thank you, and I wish us peace and security. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Next on, on the list is Surya. Good 
I'm honored to convey to you the greetings of the Syrian speaker and wish you all the best in this assembly. I am pleased to see all the efforts uh, aimed at uh, uh, conducting the works of this conference. We in Syria, we love life. And therefore, we are trying to find a space for dialogue and compromise. Hence, our participation today, because we believe in this international parliamentary union, and we have high confidence in diplomatic, uh, in parliamentary diplomacy, to try and resolve the problems of the world. This goes hand in hand with foreign policy and gives greater credibility to states and countries internally and at the international level. We need to start by uh, engaging in activities inside parliaments uh, through uh, friendship groups, various parliamentary committees. Syria is one of the countries that have always believed in the role and importance of parliamentary diplomacy in trying to build bridges for peace and understanding, because we are confident that a real dialogue and a constructive dialogue is the only way to reach solutions and our objectives. Contrary to some countries that pretend to be superpowers, such as the United States, and who claim to be free and democratic, but at the same time they exercise terrorism, sieges, uh, impose sanctions without any deterrence because they are superpowers. This is what has been going in my beloved country, Syria. This is why I want to reiterate that we will never be able to move forward until we all realize that these superpowers will not remain superpowers if they continue to exercise power. They have to respect international law. Ladies and gentlemen, we are listening today about uh, theories about the possibility of a third world war. We see a lot of hotspots around the world and in our region, from Palestine to, Sy to Syria, and the list is very long. We have all witnessed the barbarism of the Israeli entity uh, in front of the eyes of the world. We saw what they have done uh, 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 with the agreement and support of the United States. They have both completely violated international covenants and treaties and agreements. The Palestinians today have been defending their land to the death. And this is under the headlines of being a free people that wishes to live with sovereignty and freedom. This is a people that have uh, been historically victorious. Ladies and gentlemen, history will be a witness to the genocide against the Palestinian people and the barbarianism of the Israelis. I think the whole world is called upon today to take the right stance and to be on the right side of history, because history will not give us this opportunity a second time. Hence, we as Syrians, although we are going through really complex circumstances, and our own existence and identity are being threatened under various pretexts. Despite all this, we are trying to fight for our cause and to keep our cause and identity and our history. Despite all of this, we continue to focus on Palestine. We are proud to be Arabs and Syrians, and we will continue contributing to creating history through our struggles in the battlefields and through supporting all, uh, 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 and through by supporting all our people. We we know that in the end we will vanquish because the right is on our side and right is more powerful than the sword. We are not afraid and 
we are confident that justice will prevail. We as Syrians, we look forward and aspire to a world where human rights are protected, human dignity, the rule of law. And we need objective powers that call for the implementation of international laws. In the face of all these challenges and crises, we need to put an end to this policy of hegemony that is being practiced by the United States and their underlings, the Zionist entity. In conclusion, I am addressing the Arab nation and the Muslim nation, and I'm calling on humanity. And I would like to reiterate once again that we need to understand what is happening at the geopolitical level. And we need to put an end to the treason that is being covered by the superpowers. Thank you very much. Next on our list. Cuba, followed by Australia. Buenos dias. Good morning. Madam President, colleagues, I would like to take this opportunity to express our condemnation of the terrorist acts in Moscow and we would like to extend our sympathies to Moscow as well as the uh, families of the victims. Madam President, the full exercise of parliamentary diplomacy is vital in the current international context. Here we have multidimensional world crises. They're all linked. And the right to live in peace and security with justice and freedom is constantly under threat. This is because the most powerful of nations do not meet their international obligations with respect to arms control. They militarize cyberspace, make political and interfering use of concepts as significant as democracy and human rights. These are the powers that uh, impose the coercion and uh, unilateral sanctions on those that do not meet their requirements. And they bring about regime change through non-conventional war. Meanwhile, their own lands are awash with hate speech, racism, political brutality, and other human rights violations. The uh, deputies at the People's National Assembly of Cuba make an appeal for a fair international order that is democratic and fair. We need to do away with the root causes of hunger and inequality and promote sustainable development for all peoples. We would defend the full exercise of multilateralism, and we reject all wars, including non unconventional wars, wars that are intended, intent on imposing unipolar power, as well as those stealing natural resources, imposing unilateral coercive measures, and bringing all sorts of pressures to bear, which undermine peace and stability. This regardless of the United Nations Charter. Madam President, the unilateral measures adopted by some states that act against international law must be denounced through parliamentary diplomacy. These are measures that undermine peace, understanding, security, stability, and the livelihoods of people, as well as the credibility of multilateral institutions. With respect to Cuba, for over 60 years, we have resisted the merciless unilateral blockade that is economic as well as commercial and financial, which was renewed in 2019 and during the pandemic, and which is still standing today. The government of the United States is, uh, refuses to acknowledge the near unanimous requirement of the international community that they bring an end to their illegal and cruel policy vis-a-vis -vis Cuba. And they bring about material shortages, 
need, suffering, as well as uh, dissatisfaction and discouragement in Cuba. Despite the limitations imposed upon us through this American blockade, we have managed to show that we can cooperate and with other countries, and this in the interests of uh, peace, dialogue, and understanding. We speak for our country's commitment for the strengthening of integration in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this year, we're commemorating the 10th anniversary of the proclamation of our region as a region of peace, adopted at the uh, summit of the CELAC, which took place in Havana. We would uh, support the request made by the Gulag Parliament of the Secretary of the United Nations that we that the International Day of Democracy be dedicated to the international dimensions to democracy and its uh, ties to peace and sustainable development. We condemn the Israel's genocide in Palestine and the Gaza Strip. We require a fair, broad-based and lasting solution to the Middle Eastern conflict which will guarantee the Palestinian people the right to have their own state within the 1967 borders with the capital in East Jerusalem. Parliamentary democracy can contribute to efforts to find a more cooperative attitude towards the South that shows greater solidarity. We would appeal for ways of providing progress through sustainable development that go beyond GDP and we provide developing countries with access to fair funding and uh, fair technical cooperation. On behalf of the parliamentarians of Cuba, we appeal for peace, understanding and solidarity. We would reject domination and hegemony and any unilateral coercive missions or genocidal blockades. This in, in the interest of imposing one cultural model we would call for parliamentary diplomacy to guarantee cooperation and dialogue, this in the interest of social justice for Cuba and for the entire world. Thank you. Thank you, Cuba. Now, our next speaker is Australia, followed by Latvia. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President and fellow delegates, I am grateful for the opportunity to contribute to the debate on this fundamentally important issue on behalf of the Australian Parliament. The IPU was founded on the notion that dialogue is central to the peaceful resolution of conflict. The Australian Parliament actively promotes parliamentary dialogue and recognises the importance of creating the opportunity to exchange ideas, to respect differences, and to identify shared aspirations. As part of these efforts, in 2023, Australian parliamentarians made 28 outgoing delegation visits and welcomed nine delegations, including those from Germany, Vanuatu, and Indonesia. In addition, Australia hosted the Conference of Speakers and Presiding Officers of the Commonwealth in January 2023 and we remain an active member of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Australia's parliamentary networks and country groups are an important component of Australia's international program by providing an opportunity to promote understanding, improve knowledge and foster democratic development. Established by parliamentarians to provide an opportunity to raise awareness of issues and promote shared interests in, non in a non-partisan manner, Parliamentary networks are open to all parliamentarians. The Australian Parliament maintains 11 parliamentary networks. As a global community, we face many challenges, including conflict, rising inequality, the lack of economic opportunity and rapid technological change. In this context, the globalisation and digitalisation of the economy presents significant challenges for the international tax system as corporations exploit differences and gaps in our domestic tax rules and international standards to avoid or significantly reduce paying taxation. It is estimate, estimated that base erosion and profit shifting, or BEPS as it is known, 
undertaken by multinational corporations, deny the world's economy approximately $500 billion in revenue every year. These tax avoidance practices is concern for all of us because it not only undermines the efficiency and sustainability of our international tax system, but it significantly hampers progress to achieving the sustainable development goals. By denying states revenue for essential public services, including the fundamentals of healthcare and education, these tax avoidance practices foster inequality and undermine public trust, thereby causing significant harm, particularly to society's most vulnerable. Over the last year, Australia's parliamentary committees have uncovered significant efforts on the part of multinational corporations to deliberately avoid corporate tax responsibilities in Australia. Our committees found that a consultancy firm attempted to monetise confidential government information to enable foreign companies to avoid taxation in Australia, thereby putting at risk an estimated $118 million in revenue per year. Our committees will continue to, with their inquiries while considering in the integrity measures necessary to enhance and strengthen our own anti-tax avoidance laws and the implementation of the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development Base Erosion and Profit Shifting 15 actions. At the same time as BEPS are a global challenge, we must work together here through the IPU to achieve global coordinated solutions. As legislators, we have the power if we choose to consider this an important issue, we have the power together to act alongside the OECD to tackle BEPS, to hold multinational companies accountable for their global tax practices. We have the power together to restore public trust in our tax system and to build a more resilient global economy and vitally for all of us, a sustainable, ethical future. I thank the Assembly for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Australia. And now it's uh, Latvia followed by Cambodia. Dear Madam President, dear members, members of parliaments, distinguished guests, the term parliament originates from the idea of discussions or parleys. Representing Latvia, a small country, I would like to bring here the perspective of smaller nations that often find their needs overlooked in global talks. My country lies on shores of the Baltic Sea with close to 2 million inhabitants. Its history, marked by foreign interventions, culminated in the regaining of independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Grateful to Latvian politicians and international support, I regard this day of regaining sovereignty as the best event of my life. In 2007, hearing that the Russian President Mr. Putin described the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, I felt alarmed. I feared that this regret signaled a desire to regain the, the lost empire. In 2008, Russia attacked Georgia. In 2014, Russia annexed Crimea, a peninsula belonging to Ukraine. In 2022, Russia started a full-scale military invasion of Ukraine. As a person from a small country, I'm apprehensive. Such aggressions by a larger country against smaller sovereign states undermine the foundation of international law and the principles upon which countries founded the United Nations. We may not allow those violating the rights of the people to prevail since they have more power, a louder voice, or more money for disinformation. 
Now, Latvia and other countries focus much on defense, and yet we face so many global challenges. Climate change, underfunded health care, threats of hunger, biodiversity loss. This is where we would need to put our efforts. Such aggressive conflicts are costly for the affected country and for all of us. Since we need to focus on the consequences of conflict instead of combating climate change and investing in health care. Russian delegation asked us to condemn the terror act in Moscow. I condemn the terror act. My deepest condolences for the victim. But please stop to politize that, this terrible attack, and misuse it as a pretext against other countries distributing disinformation. Why Russia is silent about its behavior? I condemn Russia's attacks on civilians in Ukraine. More than 11,000 civilians died due to attacks. Occupiers deported 20,000 Ukrainian children to Russia, part of them forcibly given for adoption. I condemned the terror act by Hamas in Israel on 7th of October, and my heart was bleeding for the victims. But I am not closing my eyes. I see that the shelling of Gaza killed 30,000 of women and children. My heart is bleeding. We shall not bear any tolerance towards escalation of aggression. The deeds of terrorists cannot be a pretext for massive attacks on civilians. I ask for a ceasefire no and continue in a parliamentary way. Unfortunately, we parliamentarians failed to adopt a resolution addressing the crisis of Gaza. However, the majority of us agreed to the text of resolutions to a large extent. Why did we fail? We share one planet. Earth is our joint home. Everything happening in one region affects others. The breaches of international rules in one region encourages violators in other regions. The carbon dioxide emitted in one part of the world warms up another part of the world, bringing storms, floods or droughts. As parliamentarians, we must champion dialogue over conflict, truth over misinformation and cooperation over division. We shall not bear any tolerance for violators of the rules. We shall bear solidarity with victims, not the perpetrators. Even if aggressors are influential countries, we shall not trade short-term games over international rules, from which we are all benefiting in the long term. Together, we can address these global issues, prior prior prioritizing the well-being of all nations, large and small. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Latvia. I now call Cambodia, followed by uh, Vietnam. Thank you. And I really hope all speakers stick to the five minutes assigned. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, Honorable Distinguished Delegate, Excellency, Ladies and Gentlemen. To begin my remark, I would like to congratulate Her Excellency Julia Axon, President of the IPU, for just in a few short months, I achieved so much in building bridge for peace and understanding. I would like also to express my deep gratitude to our former President, Mr. Duarte Pacheco, for all his accomplishments during the time of the world was facing the pandemic. On behalf of the Parliament of the Kingdom of Cambodia, I have a great honor and a great pleasure to address this general debate under the theme Diplomacy, Building Bridges for Peace and Understanding, which is timely and relevant for the current global challenges. Global peace has been under attack in recent times, as the world is facing great uncertainty, persistent of armed conflict and geopolitical tension caused by major powers, nationalism, populism, mega extremists, oppression and hatred across various regions, and that has now been only destabilized nation and slowed down development effort 
but also exacerbate human humanitarian crisis, resulting in more deaths and forced millions of people to run. As my country emerged from a terrifying abyss of decades of war, famine, torture, nation genocide, and the destruction in mind, soul, and body, we, the Cambodians, know very clear that peace is priceless. Without peace, there is no liberty, no rule of law, no democracy, no human right, minimum movement, minimum education, minimum health care, minimum development, and people are unhappy, living in insecurity. As a member of the United Nations, even facing our own difficulty, we landmines, Cambodia contribute it personal and its technical assistance to help the problem of landmine in various countries. Since 2006, Cambodia has deployed 9,281 Cambodian peacekeepers, including more than 762 women, to the United Nations peacekeeping operation in nine countries. The first half of 2022, 800 Cambodian peacekeepers have been deployed to South Sudan, Lebanon, Central, Central African Republic, and Mali. We also share knowledge, experiences, and skills with other mine action globally. We have gone from war to achieving peace and from peace to development and prosperity. In July 2023, Cambodian held its congressional election according to our constitution. 18 political parties participated and more than 8.2 million people casted their vote higher than the United Nations supervised election in 1993. There were observers from 65 countries under the atmosphere of peace, free, fair, just incredible. After the new legislature of the National Assembly was formed, they elect Her Excellency Khun Soudhary, the first woman president. Then later, this assembly was approved the new government cabinet headed by a new generation, His Excellency Hun Manet, at the age of only 46. And just last month, on February 25, 2024, dictated by our constitution, the Senate hold a free and fair and just and credible election before party participate. The result was that we will have two opposition parties and the next Senate mandate starting the beginning of April this year. Our parliament will work closely with the IPU, NAM, and IPA, and all the legislative entity. The Kingdom of Cambodia is an independent, sovereign, peaceful, permanent, neutral, and non-aligned nation, a non-aligned state. I form our minister, Samdak Tepadei Hunmanat, will continue to work closely with the ASEAN member state and member of the United Nations to ensure the protection of peace, stability, security, and development. Our constitution stipulates that Cambodia shall not authorize any foreign military base in its ter territory. Cambodia coexists peacefully with its neighbor and with all other countries throughout the world. Honorable Delegate, may I conclude by taking the experience or lesson from the past Cambodian civil war in terms of dialogue and the negotiation with the hardcore of the former members of the Communist Khmer Rouge that torture, massacre millions of Cambodians between 1975 to 1979. The result of that dialogue was that former Prime Minister Samdak Dai Cho Hun Sen courageously succeeded by using his strategy of win-win policy to bring the hard-earned peace to the people of Cambodia till today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Cambodia. The next speaker is Vietnam, followed by Al Yemen.
Madam President, distinguished delegate, we are living in a world of rapid and unpredictable changes. While peace remains a major trend, conflict, regional wars, armed races profoundly affect the international security, people's life, undermine the progress in poverty reductions, slow down the implementations of commitment in sustainable development, environment respond to climate change of countries in the world. In that uh, context, parliamentary diplomacy has effectively played its role. Vietnam highly appreciates the role and continuous efforts of IPU in this regard. A peaceful world cannot be achieved through violence, coercion, impositions. Peace is always a constant aspiration of humanity. However, it is a challenging journey which requires determination, solidarity, continuous effort of each individual organization, nations, and people. As a nation with the traditions of fighting for independence, we deeply understand the values of peace. We desire humanity to live in peace, freedom, prosperity, and happiness. Vietnam pursues an independent self reliant foreign policies of peace, friendship, cooperation, and development, uh, diversification of foreign relations, being a friend, partner, active, responsible member of the international community. We are ready to act as a bridge for cooperation and dialogue, contribute to the common effort of the international community to address challenges of the time. We underscore the principles of resolving disputes and conflicts through peaceful means without threat or use of force in compliance with international law, the UN Charter. With the aspirations of a peaceful and prosperous world, we wish to forward the following recommendations, strengthen parliamentary diplomacy, promote cooperation, dialogue, understanding, build trust, respect for peace, prevent conflicts and wars on the basis of international law and international UN Charter. Member parliaments should create legal framework, streamline the uh, into domestic laws, exercise oversight over international commitment for peace, cooperation, sustainable development, including armed controls and weapons of mass uh, destruction, promote human centered policies, ensure democracy, equality, non discriminations, enhance the capacity for countries to in conflict resolutions. Encourage Parliament to engage in diplomatic effort, peace processes to prevent and resolve conflicts and wars. Given the achievements over the past 125 years of development, I expect that IPE will continue to select initiatives for Member Parliament to continue to play a leading role, coordinate more closely with the UN and Parliaments to build bridges for sustainable peace. I believe that despite the fact that humanity is good face challenges, Mutual understanding will always be the driving fo force to have overcome, to work towards a brighter future, a more sustainable peace, a more prosperous development. We condemn all the acts of uh, terrorists uh, in all the forms. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Vietnam. Our next speaker is Yemen followed by Slovenia. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ma'ali Reis al Rahman al-Dawli. In the name of God, the compassionate and the merciful, uh, Madam President, Mr. Secretary General, Speakers of Parliament, uh, fellow parliamentarians, good morning. I would like at the outset to congratulate the President of the IPU on her election uh, to uh, the presidency of this organization. I would also like to uh, congratulate her for having visited the Middle East and uh, visiting the occupied territories at the beginning of her term. It is uh, possible to have peace if you have ties uh, between countries, civilizations, and cultures. Uh, we can have peace if we get to know each other and spend time together. That way we can uh, find common goals. Par parliamentary diplomacy has a heightened role today. This is a way that we can meet our objectives. We can share knowledge and experience as well as ensure that we as parliaments can uh, monitor uh, executive, uh, the executive branches of our governments. We do need to redouble our efforts in the interests of peace 
and democracy in order to ensure that uh, we live in a world with prosperity, justice, equality, and peaceful coexistence. Ladies and gentlemen, our parliament participated in uh, a, a national dialogue, and we launched an initiative to agree uh, a roadmap, this through a participative uh, an exercise involved everyone, uh, all civil society players. Through this exercise, we managed to reach consensus. We made decisions that are enshrined in this roadmap. It reflects our shared values. However, today, uh, women, elderly people, and children are being massacred. Houses are under attack and being destroyed. We cannot remain silent in the face of this uh, hideous crime. There is chaos uh, which is spreading over borders in our region. Uh, ours is a global world, a globalized world that is supposed to be open. However, the countries that make up one quarter of the world are enduring a war and suffering, hence the heightened role of parliamentary diplomacy. We must continue to work in favor of democracy. We must do what we can to ensure that our parliamentary role is played fully so that we can supervise the executive uh, branches of government. We need to ensure that we have effective mechanisms in place in order to help us meet those objectives. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are meeting at an opportune moment. This uh, is a time when uh, we have an unprecedented uh, situation. I'm thinking in particular of the Palestinian people. For over six months now, they have been undergoing uh, massacres which uh, have led to over 75,000 wounded and uh, tens of thousands of deaths. Our meeting, regrettably, was not able to uh, step up to the plate to, to uh, actually uh, agree on a language against this uh, genocide against the Palestinian people. These people warrant our full attention. We must uh, find a way of showing solidarity with the Palestinian people. These people must uh, be allowed to exercise uh, their right to self-determination. We must find a way of bringing an end to this war which uh, must be uh, on our minds, on our consciences. We must all be aware of the fact that Palestine is uh, occupied today. And this leads to instability, which is uh, going to haunt us until the end of time, unless we find a way of dealing with this problem. We would like to... Uh, thank the authorities who have enabled us to meet here. Thank you. It's Slovenia, followed by El Bahrain. Thank you, Madam Chair, esteemed Chair and colleagues. The number of armed conflicts around the world has been rising and is currently at its highest level since the Second World War. This has also been accompanied by the highest ever number of casualties, displaced persons, human rights violations, and breaches of international humanitarian law. Sadly, civilians are those paying the highest toll in the modern armed conflicts, falling victims to the landmines and unexploded ordnance. They are being deliberately targeted, preventing them from accessing their homes, food, and water, and education and healthcare. We must therefore step up our efforts to shield the civilian and critical civilian infrastructure during the armed conflicts. Moreover, humanitarian aid should be provided to those affected without delay. 
and the international community should direct more efforts towards preventing processes leading to conflicts and atrocities, focusing particularly on early and appro appropriate response. The key factor in ensuring international peace and security is an effective multilateralism with the United Nations playing a central role therein. That is why Slovenia has chosen to run for a non-permanent seat on the Security Council, where it is beginning its two-year tenure this year. Securing a non-permanent seat was certainly an achievement, but we are also aware of the great responsibility it brings. The current difficult geopolitical situation, mainly caused by the war in Ukraine and the ongoing developments in Israel and Palestine, has been reflected in the operational dynamic of the Security Council. Items on the agenda are multiplying, yet there seems to be less and less consensus over there. Given the present dynamic within the Security Council, Slovenia sees an opportunity for non-permanent members to play a role in overcoming the impediments faced by the Security Council when responding to threats to international peace and security. With this in mind, Slovenia has adopted a proactive, transparent and integra integrative approach to addressing the issues within the Security Council. In this regard, I would also like to inform you that Slovenia has identified prevention of conflicts, protection of the population in armed conflicts and women, peace and security as priority areas of its engagement in the Security Council. Ladies and gentlemen, Slovenia will continue to act as a connecting force and a constructive player actively seeking progress on the global issues with, a, with an unbased perspective from a small country, a small country's uh, standpoint. As a new member of the Security Council, it will promote mediation as a key tool and one of the most effective means for preventing, uh, preventing conflicts and creating the conditional for peace. For this reason, Slovenia also takes an active part in the group of friends of mediation and the group of friends of mediation in the Mediterranean. Let me underline that we pay particular attention to developments in Europe, notably Ukraine, the Western Balkans, the situation in the Nagorno-Karabakh region and the Mediterranean, as this most directly impact our region and consequently our security. We also pay close attention to the worrying situation in the Middle East and Africa, which the Security Council is monitoring as part of political, security and humanitarian endeavors. Ladies and gentlemen, no country can successfully overcome the numerous challenges and threats to the national peace and security on its own. It is therefore imperative that we join our forces and respond to the challenges in a coordinated and timely manner. As parliamentarians, we play a vital role in this process. That is why I support the discussion in this assembly, which I believe will prove to be an important step uh, forward in our joint endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Slovenia. Our next speaker is Bahrain. El Bahrain followed by South Africa. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Distinguished President of the IPU, distinguished Chair, Secretary General, Your Excellencies, Speakers of the World's Parliaments, may peace be with all of you. At the outset, allow me to congratulate uh, Julia Exxon for her well-deserved uh, recent election uh, to become president of the Union, and I wish her every success. And I sincerely hope that uh, our deliberations will be successful and that we will adopt a 
important decisions to strengthen peace and security in today's world. Allow me to convey to you the uh, greetings of uh, speakers of our two Houses of Parliament, and uh, they also wish you every success at this assembly. Allow me to express my condolences to the people and government of Russia for the recent uh, attacks in Moscow. President, our debate addresses the issue of parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding with a view to achieving the SDGs. And that reflects the importance of diplomacy and parliamentary diplomacy and its role in trying to rise to today's challenges. Parliamentary diplomacy is complementary to the efforts of our governments, who will also try to support the key principles of the United Nations to promote harmony and peaceful coexistence. And we have a key role in uh, trying to strengthen parliamentary diplomacy, particularly uh, if you look at the current situation, which is a major challenge to world peace and security. Of course, we all want to achieve uh, better results. And I believe that uh, at this assembly, we need to amend our rules of procedure in order to become more effective so that we can um, have a better impact uh, and deal with our affairs more efficiently, um, in particular in relation to the war of aggression uh, by Israel against the people of Palestine, which is, leaving, uh, which is uh, leading to terrible, atrocious uh, loss of life, uh, especially among women, children, and the elderly. And unfortunately, uh, President, we have seen that our uh, union has failed to adopt a decision on the emergency item for the second time running. Because the stronger, uh, the stronger representatives here have not been able to hold out a hand and accommodate the weaker. And uh, we need to reach some kind of compromise so that uh, we can support the Palestinian people and so that the Palestinians can set up uh, their state uh, with the, along the 1967 borders with Jerusalem as its capital. President, for many decades now, our country has been a member of the United Nations and been an effective uh, partner in many international organizations. And we have uh, supported many efforts around the world to try to build bridges for peace and understanding among nations and peoples. We've uh, organized a series of dialogues uh, and meetings in that respect as well. President, we need to um, strengthen the key role of uh, IPU and parliamentary diplomacy in order to set the foundations for international peace and understanding. But the UN Security Council has failed to adopt a resolution to put an immediate end uh, to hostilities in Gaza. And we need to think carefully about that. We need to think about why that's the case and the implications of that. And many parliamentary delegations have stressed on the need for an immediate, immediate ceasefire. President, the Kingdom of Bahrain is determined to strengthen international partnerships, to work together with other nations and peoples. And we will continue to send out a message of peace, civilization, and understanding. We have been doing this for 4,000 years. We've always been at the forefront of efforts to build understanding and peace, and to strengthen <clears throat> links between religions, faiths, and communities around the world. Strengthening this spirit of dialogue and uh, building bridges among all of us. Thank you.
شكرا بحرين ثانك يو بحرين اور نيكست سبيكر از ساوث افريكا فولود باي رواندا Thank you very much, Honorable President of the Assembly, Honorable President of the Interparliamentary Union, Honorable Presiding Officers, Honorable Members, and Distinguished Guests. It is indeed an honor to stand before you today to mark the dawn of a new era as we welcome the election of the new IPU President. Her election stands as a testament to her exemplary leadership and unwavering dedication. I wish to extend my heartfelt congratulations on her election and express my best wishes for her success as she steps into the significant responsibilities and challenges that comes with that high office. Honorable President of the Assembly, to achieve sustainable peace, we must bravely confront underlying injustices which perpetuate inequality and hinder human development. It is with this profound understanding that we have gathered here today to address the urgent need to broker lasting peace and understanding, particularly in conflict-stricken regions. It is a responsibility of this leadership collective, representing this August House today, to build a new social and political order by actively seeking new ways for us to build bridges for peace and understanding amongst and between nations through parliamentary diplomacy. As the world goes through a difficult period of deepened international turbulence, where global peace is threatened by polarization, it is upon us, as the custodians of democracy and peace, to ensure that we use every responsible or possible avenue available to us to foster lasting peace and cohesion amongst all the nations of the world through dialogue, consensus building, and negotiation. Thus, we cannot accomplish by picking sides. Instead, we must create a platform for everyone to be heard without judgment to ensure that we broker a new construct of understanding and empathy, even where deeply divergent views have been held. The people of Palestine have endured a lack of peace and security for the longest of times. And this is a situation in dire need of redress. It is in this spirit that the South African government as a state party to the Genocide Convention has sought legal intervention to prevent further devastation in the Gaza, an area witnessing one of the deadliest conflicts of the 21st century. As we reflect on these stark realities, I am reminded of the profound words of Blin Eni Ha, who described this as the first genocide in history broadcasted in real time by its victims. This tragic circumstance compels us to urgently support initiatives that can deliver enduring peace between the Israeli and Palestinian peoples. It is imperative that we keep channels of communication and dialogue open to unequivocally advocate for a two-state solution. Honorable President, in South Africa, we welcome the International Court of Justice's firm and legally binding provisional measures on Israel requiring it to do everything within its power to prevent genocidal acts during the conflict in the Gaza. Consequently, third states are now mandated to conduct themselves in a manner consistent with the Genocide Convention, ensuring that they do not aid or abet genocidal actions. This measure places a significant obligation on all our parliaments to exercise their constitutional duty ensuring that their governments refrain from contributing to genocidal acts. We need to now put measures in place as the IPU to ensure that we collectively oversee the implementation of the ICJ provisional measures while establishing other mechanisms to address issues, including the matter of detainees, hostages, and build consensus around how we can begin to systematically segment these issues to address them with the urgency it deserves. As I reflect on South Africa's participation in the IPU Task Force on the Russia-Ukraine conflict, it becomes clear that it has provided a meaningful opportunity to pursue processes towards the cessation of hostilities 
and seek a diplomatic solution through dialogue and consensus. In conclusion, as parliaments, by embracing and implementing these good practices, we contribute to fostering peaceful and collaborative international relations. Through our dedicated efforts in parliamentary, parliamentary diplomacy, we facilitate understanding, collaboration, and constructive engagement on the global stage. It is by championing these values that we further the cause of peace and understanding, demonstrating our shared commitment to building a more harmonious and an equitable world. Thank you for your unwavering dedication to these efforts. Efforts, Kiali Boha. Thank you very much. Bye, Danke. Thank you, South Africa. Next is Rwanda, followed by Bolivia. Madam, Madam President of the Assembly, Excellencies, good morning. On behalf of the Parliament of the Republic of Rwanda, allow me to thank the leadership of the IPU for a continued focus on the promotion of peace through the choice of this theme, parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. Excellencies, before 1994, Rwanda experienced a lack of peace because of governance characterized by divisive policies along ethnic lines. Those divisive politics resulted in, in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, which was stopped by the intervention of the then Rwandan Patriotic Front Army, led by the current President of the Republic of Rwanda, His Excellency Paul Kagame. Rwandans remain committed to continuously honor the memory of over a million victims reflecting on the lessons learned from that painful period in our history and the further paying tribute to the heroes who made sacrifices to bring it to an end. Despite the challenges Rwanda faced in the aftermath of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, the nation has now transformed into a peaceful country characterized by unity and social cohesion among its population. We chose to embrace a vision of consensual and pluralistic democracy founded on the principles of power sharing, equal opportunity, inclusiveness, and resolution of conflict through dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, governments worldwide conceive and implement mechanisms aimed at conflict resolution and peace building within their respective countries. Through parliamentary diplomacy, parliaments should likewise assume strategic positions to reinforce and consolidate these efforts. It is particularly imperative for parliaments to advocate for and encourage governments to implement peace agreements but also to enact policies that have a positive impact on peace at the national, regional, and international levels. Excellencies, regarding my country, Rwanda, allow me, Madam President, Excellencies, concerning the false allegation by the delegation of DRC in its statement delivered yesterday, to reiterate that my previous replies to those unfounded allegations were very clear. I would like to further emphasize to this assembly that the FDRR, a Rwandan et ethnic militia consisting of individuals who participated in the 1994 genocide against Tutsi, is currently active in the DRC. The FDRR continues to propagate hate speech and genocide ideology with impunity. They represent, they along the border of Rwanda, their association with the DRC National Army, and their preservation by the DRC government poses a serious security threat, not only to Rwanda, but also to the entire Great Lakes region. The government of DRC signed to Rwanda and the Nairobi processes as an implementing partner and should focus on their full implementation. Attempts by the DRC to sabotage or abandon these regional agreements can only be seen as a choice 
to perpetuate conflict and insecurity. Therefore, Rwanda urges the international community, including through platforms such as this assembly, to call upon the government of the DRC to seize its collaboration with and the preservation of the FDRL and implement effectively the above, the above mentioned national processes as well as other international facilitations and the peace mechanisms. Excellencies, 30 years after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, many gen genocide suspects remain at large as they, they fled Rwanda and found refuge in various countries. It is imperative that measures be taken to prevent them from evading accountability for their crimes. In conclusion, we would like to invite you to join us in learning from and sharing the lessons of our painful past as we continue to, to work towards effective approaches to peaceful settlement of conflicts and forge understanding among people and stabilization during times of crisis. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Rwanda. Our next speaker is Bolivia, followed by Jordan. Muy bueno, dia. A very good morning, President. And, on, and uh, I'd also like to convey to the people and uh, authorities of Geneva uh, and to all of the parliamentarians here um, greetings from the government of Bolivia. The host uh, at this 148th uh, Interparliamentary Assembly and in, in the framework of this general debate, parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding, uh, my name is uh, Rodriguez Montero, and I'm uh, representing the plurilateral state of uh, Bolivia, and I'm from the Amazon region. As a parliamentarian over the last few days, I've heard on a number of occasions that uh, we're all here to seek peace. We are all seeking to consolidate equality, to guarantee the future lives of, our gen of uh, current and future generations. We've all heard about the need uh, to show respect for fundamental rights, including the right to democracy. But we are seeing uh, a scourge that is raging in all of our states now. We've seen uh, hunger, authoritarianism, persecution, violence, and uh, a failure to respect fundamental rights. We are seeing our peoples affected in an atrocious way and uh, the, the uh, damage to the environment. Uh, um, exploitation of our natural resources, including our forests and our um, animal populations and many other problems. We are seeing the, the constant expansion of mining, agricultural activity in countries like Bolivia, the constant uh, um, progress of uh, coca leaf production. And it's not the first time I've spoken about uh, coca leaf. It's been expanded into various different provinces in uh, Bolivia without control, and it's leading to the extinction of many indigenous peoples. The production of uh, coca leaf is now undermining peace and uh, undermining the future of my indigenous brothers and sisters. The European <coughs> Union, we heard, was supporting Bolivia uh, with uh, millions of dollars uh, to, un to, to um, destroy some of its forest. We thank the European Union, but we need to speak the truth. The government of Bolivia is uh, burning and giving the authorization to coca leaf producers and mining companies to destroy the forest. And they're doing that because of uh, uh, vested interests. These mining companies are coming to the forests and uh, the uh, indigenous peoples are losing everything because of these uh, fires. The money will just remain uh, in the pockets of a few. That's because there are small groups of people 
earning money from this process. And the result is a lack of food for others, a lack of justice, an increase in poverty, and an increase in corruption. In spite of all of this, we continue to hope that we can change uh, the, for the better with uh, real inclusion of the poorest people of our country. We hope to build a more uh, solid democracy with education, where our young people, our women, our children and adolescents have more chances, and in particular our indigenous peoples, who are taken into account in some countries, but uh, don't often de decide on the future of their countries. That's why we are brought together to try to seek mechanisms that will help us to build um, stronger regimes with real democracy, where all of us try to guarantee the f the, our, uh, the f the f our, our and current generation's future. I believe that parliamentary diplomacy can play a role. We have seen uh, at this 148th Parliamentary Assembly proposals to try to deal with some of the critical challenges that we're facing in our states. Thank you. Thank you, Bolivia. And now the floor is for Jordan, followed by... We don't know yet. Okay. Bismillah. In the name of God, the most merciful. Madam President of the IPU, Mr. Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen, heads and members of the participating delegations, I wish to greet you on my behalf and on behalf of the Jordanian delegation. We are extremely happy to be here, and we are grateful for the IPU and the Secretariat for all the efforts that have made to, they have made to organize this assembly. Without any further introduction, I would like to say with a lot of pain that the world has failed us and has ignored international law when it has chosen to remain silent in the face of the most horrendous crime being committed in modern history, when Israel is committing a crime of genocide against the people of Gaza and Palestine. What, is Gaza, what Gaza is going through is a full-fledged crime of genocide being perpetrated by the Israeli occupation. The international community must not fail this test and must work on implementing international humanitarian law and guarantee its respect. This horrendous war must stop. Today, we have to answer a series of questions. Are we complicit? in this genocide by remaining silent and not condemning these crimes? Until when are we going to remain silent? This is shameful. International reports state that crime of genocide is being committed by the occupation forces in Gaza, and this requires an immediate intervention by all the forces in the world in order to put an end to these crimes and prosecute the perpetrators. This requires us all in this assembly to urge our governments to take the necessary positions and decisions in order to be able to save our credibility in front of the parliaments of the people that we represent. And here I would like to say that the international reports by the United Nations and the WHO and the FAO 
the IPC, and all other international reports uh, regarding the situation of human rights are uh, uncovering the lies that we have heard yesterday from the Israeli delegate. And we ask that delegate to go back where they came from and tell the Israelis enough of the lies, enough of the manipulation and distortion of the truth. You must act as humans who respect humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, from this forum that includes representatives of the democracies of the world, how can we talk about a peaceful society? How can we talk about peace for the peoples of the world at a time when the international community cannot force Israel to accept the resolutions of the international legitimacy? How can the international community that calls for the respect of human rights and dignity, how can it remain silent and be unable to put an end to the Israeli crimes against women and children in Gaza? How can we face the world while famine and starvation is being used as a weapon to kill the peoples of Gaza. The starvation of the children of Gaza, the bombing of unarmed civilians, of schools, hospitals, places of worship, will this achieve peace and stability? Ladies and gentlemen, Islam has a message of peace. It, uh, Muslim soldiers were required thousands of years ago not to call, uh, not to kill civilians, uh, women, children, and religious leaders. And we are here to say to the entire world that we abide by these rules of engagement. And therefore, I'm here to say that the Middle East will not be able to live in peace and stability without a permanent and fair solution to the Palestinian cause that takes into account the aspirations of the Palestinian people to establish an independent sovereign state. And I would like to caution against the uh, continued aggression against Gaza, because this will spill over and will lead to a catastrophe in the entire region. Ladies and gentlemen, as a Jordanian, I am proud to see that the um, Air Force planes are dropping aids uh, in Gaza. And I wish to commend all the parliaments and peoples of the world that have stood by the Palestinian people, starting with South Africa that has defended the values of the late Nelson Mandela when they have decided to take a firm stance with the Palestinian people and take their case before the ICJ and prosecute Israel for the crime of genocide. This, these are the true values that will prevail in the face of evil and injustice. And I would like to conclude by uh, mentioning uh, a quote by Nelson Mandela. We either live free or we do not live at all. Long live the people of Palestine, and thank you very much, and the blessings of Allah upon you. Shukran. Thank you, Jordan. Our next, our next speaker is Oman, followed by Finland. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the most merciful, the compassionate. Greetings to you all. Madam President of the IPU, 
Mr. Secretary General of the IPU, I am delighted to convey to you the greetings of the uh, head of the Shura Council in Oman and to uh, deliver this statement on my behalf and on behalf of the Omani delegation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to participate in this 148th assembly of the IPU that is being held here in Geneva. We highly appreciate the efforts made by the organizers in order to organize this meeting and achieve its objectives. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Choosing the topic of parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding as a theme for this general debate during this session comes at the right time. It is a topic and theme of utmost importance because peace and understanding are two of the most important values in our world in order to be, to be able to establish peace in this world and in order to achieve prosperity and protection and respect for all. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The Muslim re religion is a religion of peace and love, like all the other main religions. It works on organizing relations between individuals on the basis of peace and understanding, because we, as uh, peoples of the world, we have more in common than what divides us. And therefore, we need to establish friendly relations. International organizations work and strive to establish peace and security. And therefore, the IPU and its members can play an important role in respecting and implementing the principles of peace and understanding. We need to spare no effort in order to achieve these values. We need to come up with recommendations and propose guidelines in order to govern the relations between countries on the basis of peace and understanding. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Oman has a system that relies on strengthening peace and cooperation and non-interference in the issues of other countries and the affairs of other countries. In our relations with other countries of the world, we rely on these principles. And we have always tried to work on implementing these principles based on our belief in achieving understanding and respect. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, there is still a part of this world that is still under a brutal occupation and be being subjected to horrendous crimes. For more than 100 days, Gaza and Palestine has been suffering. There are more than 2 million individuals that are being subjected to the crime of genocide. They are being killed, massacred, and starved to death. There are thousands of injured, and uh, mainly women and children, that are unable to receive even the basic health care. It is a brutal war that spares no civilian under the eyes of the world. How can we call for peace while Israel continues to destroy uh, an, a population in its, in, in its entirety, completely ignoring international laws, including UN Security Council resolutions and the measures decided by the ICJ? We are, it is incumbent upon us today to take a firm stance. The IPU should take a firm stance that stresses the importance of respecting the humanity and ending the occupation. We cannot achieve peace 
in light of the ongoing brutal and unacceptable occupation. May the peace of God be upon you all. Shukran. Our next speaker is Finland, followed by Greece. Dear colleagues, we are stepping into an era that has totally different level of hazardousness compared to previous decades where risks started to escalate. Now we have autonomous weapons, artificial intelligence, terrifyingly destructive nuclear weapons, and the worst ticking time bomb of all, climate change. We really shouldn't fight each other Rather, we must learn to live peacefully and sustainably together in this tiny globe of ours. We, the politicians around the world, have the solutions in our hands, and if there only is will, we can avoid, avoid those horrors that our citizens would face. According to democracy reports, authoritarianism is taking over globally. Many countries that have money or land, they want even more of these, and in particular at the expense of the suffering of others. In the new geopolitics of greediness, the bigger want to trample on the smaller. Two years ago, Russia launched an attack where tanks rolled over the independent borders of Ukraine. Putin called this a special operation. The country was being bombed heavily. People were being raped and killed. Children were being kidnapped. Russia started to take over the areas and it tried to make its way all the way into the capital of Kyiv. I must ask you, what kind of special operation is that? According to UN's definitions, there is a word for this. It's war. When Ukraine asked the world to help and has been starting to get it, now Russia calls this special operation as a war against the West in its propaganda. What on earth? The West hasn't attacked Russia and the West has no interest in breaking the Russian sovereignty and its borders. We are helping Ukraine so that Russia could not break Ukraine's sovereignty and after that, other countries' sovereignty. We are living in the decade of 2020 and we as a humankind must be so civilized that the brutal conquests simply need to come to an end and we cannot be bystanders or remain neutral in front of what's happening. We all agree that the atrocities that, for example, many European countries did in Africa or Hitler did in Europe are condemnable with no exceptions. I still want to remind that history is being written as we speak and what is happening now is happening on our watch. Similarly, this also regards the situations in the Middle East or in the Repub Democratic Republic of the Congo. Whether it's a minor or a major tragedy, we need to act quicker so that the suffering of people comes to an end, because each and everyone's life is precious. Peace does not only mean that there is no war, but also that people can live peacefully in their own country. There are still countries where a person with albinism can get killed because other people believe that the body parts of that person can give you magic powers. Disabled people are being abandoned. Elsewhere, women are forced to be afraid of violence or they are even totally second-class citizens. 
In many countries, a gay man like me is facing a death penalty just because he loves another human. I met my husband in Finland, where he had come to study from the beautiful country of Mozambique. Even we are from the opposite sides of the globe, we have a different culture, skin color, and perspective to the world. I have come to learn that ultimately we are very similar because as humans, we eventually have the same needs. In the core of these human needs is the possibility to live in peace and in freedom. Let's not take it away from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Finland. Our next speaker is Greece, followed by Tunisia. Honorable President of the Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is a special honor to address you today in the context of the 138th Assembly of the Interparliamentary Union. We are here today, representatives of parliaments from all over the world, because we firmly believe in the power of parliamentary diplomacy on a global, regional, and bilateral level. We express our faith and belief in the important role of parliamentary diplomacy as a catalyst for mutual understanding and deeper cooperation between states and people, but also as an institution that promotes dialogue for the peaceful resolution of conflicts, the consolidation of security, the protection of the rule of law, and ultimately, democracy. In the face of modern challenges that know no border, such as the climate crisis, global threats to public health, immigration, and the digital revolution, as well as artificial intelligence, but also in the face of conflicts with a visible risk of dramatic expansion, in the face of violation of human rights and the rules of international law, in their parliamentary diplomacy can highlight common principles and universal values capable of indicating commonly accepted solutions and jointly agreed responses. We can proceed today towards goals di di dictated by tomorrow, but also to achieve the maximum possible cooperation in the face of challenges that cannot wait and threats whose outbreak we cannot withstand. For all these reasons, the topic of the 148th Assembly of the Interparliamentary Union is extremely important and timely. It is more than certain that the fruitful democratic workshop of political dialogue and synthesis of opinions of representatives of 180 national parliaments, its members, shall first strengthen the cooperation and deepen the relationship between parliaments and by extension ties among people. Second, highlight national priorities of the countries and positions on international issues at the parliamentary level. Third, build bridges for the construction of peace and understanding. The Interparliamentary Union, through national parliaments, in cooperation with other international organizations, can play a more active role in matters of world peace, security, and stability. It is also a common belief that peace is a fundamental condition for addressing glo global challenges such as the Sustainable Development Goals, which the IPU aptly chose as a strategic focus of its policy for 2024. Given that, as noted by the Stockholm International Research Institute for Peace, 56 states faced armed conflict in 2023, the global parliamentary community has a long way to go. On this path, the role of parliamentary friendship groups between countries is particularly important. They can contribute to a better understanding of problems through parliamentary dialogue, mediation, conflict avoidance, the defense of human rights, the implementation of international commitments, the development of sincere cooperation aimed at mutual benefit. In the Hellenic Parliament, parliamentary friendship groups have been set up and cooperate with 91 national parliaments. 
they strengthen the bilateral relations of friendship and cooperation and contribute to the deepening of the democracy and cooperation in the face of modern challenges. And as the, and as the Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis recently emphasized at the third summit on democracy, we must focus on unity against aggression. Democracies have a duty to unite and join their forces against aggressive behavior by states and behavior that violates international and humanitarian law. B, democratic states must regain the absolute trust of their citizens. Democracy is the only system that can provide the values that citizens truly desire, security, prosperity, freedom, respect and justice. And third, it is necessary to regulate the technology that is starting to bring about significant changes in the way of economies and societies function. It is imperative that the new challenges, new threats, dangers to the planet, to our countries and peoples create fertile ground for meaningful discussions and bold joint decisions. It is necessary, and I believe a common goal, that parliamentary diplomacy contributes to achieving results of hope and optimism for the citizens of our countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greece. Uh, now we welcome to the stage Tunisia, followed by the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Thank you, Madam President. Honorable heads and members of delegations, distinguished attendees. It is my pleasure to be with you today uh, as a representative of the Tunisian Assembly of People's Representatives. And I would like to uh, convey our sincere greetings to this honorable gathering on behalf of Mr. Brahim Bouderbala, President of the Assembly. And we wish to congratulate uh, Ms. Tulia Action and wish her all the best at the helm of this organization. We also would like to thank and express our appreciation to Mr. Martin Shongong, and all the members of the Secretariat for the efforts they are doing in managing the IPU affairs. We meet today to discuss the theme of parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. This gives us the opportunity to further discuss the role of our parliamentary of our parliamentary diplomacy in light of a global situation characterized by tension, exacerbation of conflicts and challenges, while our countries are striving to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. In this context, we should address the relationship between peace and development, which was stated in SDG 16, Peace, Justice and Effective Institutions. This has completed the currently prevailing concept of development, which is based on three axes, environmental, economic and social. According to all indicators, a peace is threatened due to emerging violent conflicts that seriously affect international humanitarian law and therefore destabilize the principle of the universality of human rights. We have to ask about uh, the limits uh, of uh, this law in the face of the systematic killing and starvation of the people of Palestine. They have been subjected to deliberate starvation and denial of their basic humanitarian rights. This has reached the stage of genocide and constitute a blatant threat to human security in full view of the world without deterrence or intervention by the international community. We must also ask about our role as representatives of our peoples. We always affirm our keenness to establish international peace and security and uphold the lofty principles of the UN Charter. We reiterate Tunisia's firm and principled position regarding the Palestinian cause, and we reaffirm our unconditional support for the brotherly Palestinian people. 
in recognizing their legitimate national rights to establish an independent and fully sovereign state with Jerusalem as its capital. We call on all the free peoples of the world, especially in our parliamentary group, to assume their historical responsibilities by intensifying their efforts and exerting more pressure through this uh, prestigious institution, the IPU, to force the Zionist entity to put an end to this barbaric and brutal war that it is waging against unarmed civilians in Gaza and the West Bank, in addition to putting an end to the provocative and arbitrary measures in Jerusalem, which have increased during this holy month. We must also stress the urgent need to reform the Security Council so that it can carry out its original function of maintaining international peace and security and refrain from adopting a policy of double standards and using the right to veto irresponsibly. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have always tried to understand the links between development and world peace. And we need to come up with more effective and efficient approaches in dealing with global challenges, such as the phenomen phenomenon of irregular migration. This is a phenomenon that cannot be the responsibility, the sole responsibility of one country. It is the responsibility of the countries of source, transit, and destination. In this regard, we stress that Tunisia is dealing with this issue responsibly and within the framework of the universal human rights system in full respect of our international obligations and with pride to belonging to our African continent. We call on further solidarity and cooperation to combat this phenomenon and address its deep economic and uh, social causes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is the United Arab Emirates. And before uh, you take the microphone, Dr. Ali, I would like Ladies and gentlemen, it was my pleasure presiding or chairing the session of the assembly this morning. It was really my pleasure. Thank you very much. I would like to call uh, the speaker of the Namibian uh, assembly, uh, Mr. Uh, Kachavik. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Some years back, yeah, that's true. That's true. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Can I start, Mr. Speaker? Or Mr. President now? I'll speak in Arabic, by the way. You have to. Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. Distinguished speaker, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, the Parliament of the United Arab Emirates, allow me to express my sincere gratitude and uh, to pay tribute to the IPU and its secretariat for the excellent organization of these assemblies um, and uh, having allowed uh, the parliaments of the world to come together here to address uh, cross-cutting important issues that reflect the aspirations of the people we represent, issues of great importance for future generations and uh, a great impact uh, on our societies uh, and our environment and our world. We are part of the interparliamentary family. And that family reflects the aspirations of our peoples, their hopes, their dreams. And so we're part of this organization because we share the same founding values, peace, dialogue, good governance, and human rights. So this institution brings us together to find common ground and to come up with solutions for the peoples and nations of the world. 
we should be working on this common ground to try to bring together our different points of view and perspectives. So it is our task to think of those fundamental values and dialogue in order to come up with solutions that find that common ground. So that's why I think we need to get back to basics. And dialogue is the only way to find solutions to our regional global problems. Through dialogue, it's not one side that will win out uh, over uh, others. Um, we will all be the winners. You know, we've heard people citing uh, the great uh, leader of South Africa, uh, which was, of course, uh, founded on dialogue to create modern South Africa. Nelson Mandela, of course, who said, if we want to have peace, if we want to build peace with enemies, we need to work with our enemies uh, until they become our allies and friends. And you know, that's what we are trying to do here uh, in this hall. We all need to work to become allies and friends. And we've heard people up here on the podium condemning, uh, criticizing. Is that a way to try to find common ground and find consensus? Is that a way of creating the right environment in which to discuss these issues and try to find solutions? Dialogue is one of the founding principles of the IPU. It's a key pillar of uh, parliamentary institutions and regrettably we haven't seen enough of that dialogue in fact uh, we failed already uh, in Rwanda and Luanda and we failed again yesterday because we weren't able to use that dialogue and you know each side was trying to win this uh, battle to the detriment of their adversaries and so I would call on you to remember that uh, yesterday the UN Security Council adopted a resolution calling for uh, a solution that we were unable to come up with, regrettably, and we deplore that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your statement. Next on my list is the Honorable Member from Morocco. سيدة الرئيسة، الزميلات والزملاء البرلمانيين. Madam President, uh, distinguished parliamentarians. The IPU has uh, wisely chosen the theme for this general debate, bringing us together uh, over these few days. Parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. Um, because uh, more uh, than ever since the Second World War ended, uh, the current uh, world is facing conflict and division. And uh, you see the massacres of uh, defenseless civilians in Gaza today, uh, people dying because of this blockade and uh, uh, this uh, aggression. That is just one example of the many uh, flagrant violations of human rights and international law, uh, which humanity must try to deal with. This level of destruction means that we have a moral duty to try to exert the necessary pressure to put an end to these crimes. 
and we need to try to deal with the underlying causes of conflict. What we have are occupied territories, and we need to be clear about that. Uh, you need to have a better future for the people living there, so that uh, Palestinians can enjoy an independent state with Jerusalem as its capital. And we fully support uh, the two-state solution. But you will be aware of the conflicts uh, affecting the African continent as well. There are about 15 of those, and millions of uh, people who have had to flee their countries uh, and homes, refugees and displaced persons uh, within their countries. 15 million people today living in deplorable conditions uh, in the Middle East. And uh, this will, of course, uh, create further instability and uh, pose a threat to international peace and security. Peace and conflict prevention must be the key to respecting uh, countries, and indeed we need to respect the territorial integrity of uh, countries. We must combat extremist speech and uh, terrorist uh, doctrines which uh, are spread and which uh, undermine uh, these values and uh, international law. Ladies and gentlemen, today it was uh, very sad to hear uh, the delegate of Algeria making remarks uh, that uh, we found very uncomfortable. And it's something we've heard at the UN Security Council. We are trying to recover land that belongs to us. And that is the key to understanding this situation. And uh, the delegate of Algeria understands that very well. That rhetoric has been heard before on a number of occasions from Algeria. Uh, this separatist uh, language which is designed to try to uh, spread uh, organized uh, crime and violence and indeed terrorism. This brings us uh, to this uh, deadlock at international uh, level um, because of uh, these lies that are being spread. It's an attempt to politicize dialogue and that um, bears no relation to uh, the issue of parliamentary diplomacy that we are supposed to be discussing. Algeria is uh, violating the fundamental principles of uh, international humanitarian law and the UN Charter. Algeria is uh, giving powers uh, and support uh, to armed separatist uh, groups uh, that are coming into our territory and destabilizing the whole region. We wish to remind you that uh, the international community welcomes the Moroccan proposal on the future of uh, this uh, territory, and uh, which is supported uh, by UN resolutions. These autonomous territories today are prospering economically and socially. And anyone who has seen the improvement in the situation uh, in those autonomous territories will tell you that. Uh, a number of parliamentary missions have visited the area, and uh, I can tell you that at local and national level, we are using parliamentary diplomacy as a tool to build uh, prosperity and security. And we would invite anybody to visit this uh, autonomous uh, region as well, um, uh, to see for yourselves uh, the situation there. And ladies and gentlemen, what we need to do uh, is strengthen de democratic institutions, and that's what we in intend to do, and uh, to uh, uh, strengthen interfaith dialogue. That will be key to building greater peace and security in the future. And we're very proud in our parliament 
to have uh, taken a number of uh, steps uh, along with uh, other parliaments and institutions around the world. We convened a parliamentary conference on uh, interfaith uh, dialogue in Marrakesh and then in uh, Rabat. We also adopted an international charter that will help us to strengthen peace and security. And these are just a few examples of the steps that we've been taking um, in our parliament because we are a key part of uh, international efforts uh, to build greater peaceful coexistence and understanding around the world so that we can fulfill the aspirations of our peoples and uh, respect our values. I don't need to remind distinguished representatives to stick to the time. Next on my list, the Honorable Speaker from Kenya. You have the floor. The President of the Assembly, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, as we meet at this 148th IPU Assembly, the world is undergoing multiple crises, and we can feel the disquiet and anguish in our shared humanity. Our collective conscience continues to be bombarded by the haunting images from the Democratic Republic of Congo Gaza, Ukraine, Chad, Mozambique, Sudan, the Sahel, and other active but largely unreported conflicts around the world. All these serve to remind us that we have broken our collective promise to bequeath the people that we represent a peaceful, prosperous, and habitable world. It, ne it necessitates prompt action and I'm glad that the theme of this assembly, parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding, seeks to rally us towards this noble cause. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, former South African President, the noble Peace Lure, Nelson Mandela, once said, and I quote, peace is not just the absence of conflict. Peace is the creation of an environment where all can flourish, regardless of race, color, creed, religion, gender, class, caste, or any other social makers of difference. Peace is therefore linked to the obligation on states to uphold democracy and respect human rights and fundamental freedoms of all individuals. The Parliament of Kenya, by dint of its primary rules of legislation, oversight and representation and budgeting has continued to play a central role in conflict preven uh, prevention and resolution. Through deployment of parliamentary diplomacy, the legislature in Kenya has recorded impressive milestones. And the protection of democracy and, polit and political pluralism, the parliament of Kenya has secured its position as an institution for political negotiation and mediation. As a pillar of democratic governance, Parliament, its representative, provides a forum for expression of political aspirations and interests. Mr. President, allow me to share very practical examples where the Kenyan Parliament has effectively and successfully deployed parliamentary diplomacy to avert ugly confrontations. On 31st of May 2018, the Kenyan Parliament established what is now known as the Building of Bridges Initiative. Through this initiative, Parliament brought together on the negotiating table all political players for negotiations on their issues and therefore for stalling potential ugly confrontations. On the 19th of May 2023, Again, the Kenyan Parliament established what is called the National Dialogue Committee 
again, bringing different political players on the negotiating table and thereby forestalling ugly confrontations. Following the 2007 28, 2008 post election violence in Kenya, Parliament passed the National Dialogue and Reconciliation Act, as, as well as the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission Act 2008, that set in motion a pathway for dialogue and eventual consensus on the ex inclusive constitutional review process that culminated in the promulgation of the Constitution of Kenya 2010. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I wish to remind us that the fluid situation prevailing across our globe, fueled by ending conflicts and upheavals, the need for Parliament to lead from the front in peace building and conflict resolution has never been more dire and urgent. In this regard, I call upon IPU as an eminent global caucus for Parliament to step to the plate and help in deploying parli parliamentary diplomacy liberally for better outcomes for the benefit of our people. Parliamentarians are the direct representatives of the people and their voices must rise above the din of the war and help in promoting unity, diffusing tensions and restoring livelihoods in the regions shattered by wars and conflicts. As parliamentarians, we should do whatever it takes not to allow warring parties to take the differences to the battlefield. Parliamentary diplomacy is about bringing warring parties to the negotiating table for peaceful resolutions. If we can, as parliamentarians, convince our people to vote for us, then, with the same zeal, we can equally convince and persuade our people to drop their weapons and impress peace through parliamentary diplomacy. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attempting to keep up with the time. Asante Sana. Next on my list, the distinguished representative from Eswatini. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Guinea, I'm sorry. Guinea. I jumped the gun. Forgive me. Excellence, Your Excellency, President of the Interparliamentary Union, Speakers, Heads of Delegation, Ladies and Gentlemen, Distinguished Guests, I'm great, uh, it's a great honour for me to take the floor before this uh, August Assembly, the 148th Interparliamentary Assembly, to speak on the theme of uh, parliamentary diplomacy building bridges for peace and understanding. On behalf of Dr. Dansa Kurama, uh, President of our National uh, Transitional Council in the Republic of Guinea, who has asked me uh, to convey to you his warmest greetings, I wish to say at the outset how grateful I am to the Swiss authorities for the very warm welcome that they have given my delegation and myself. And I wish to congratulate IPU for the excellent organization of the Assembly. On behalf of my Parliament and the people of Guinea, I also must uh, convey our congratulations to the uh, newly elected uh, President uh, of our common organization, the Interparliamentary Union. The importance of this theme is, of course, uh, at the forefront of all of our minds, because many of our people are facing a rapid political change linked to conflict and wars with uh, damaging effects on uh, the enjoyment of human rights. I'm delighted to be able to speak uh, to the representatives of parliaments from all over the world today when the Republic of Guinea has launched a historic process under General Mamadou Doumbaya, President of the Republic. We are carrying out a whole overhaul of uh, our uh, society, and we're trying to avoid the mistakes of the past. 
promoting dialogue and peaceful coexistence, and respecting the principles of uh, the UN Charter, the principle of the non-use of force and peaceful relations are absolutely key principles. They are non-negotiables. Given the uh, plethora of conflicts around the world, efforts must be made to reinvigorate parliamentary diplomacy and work on the prevention of conflicts. And that would wouldn't mean that would mean that states wouldn't have to spend money on dealing with the consequences of uh, conflict. And as representatives of our different peoples, I believe we must be um, capable of carrying out an exercise in self-reflection as well. Think about the aspirations of our people and try to understand our duty to support peace processes and conflict resolution. As conflicts, we must work together to try to give a real meaning to the term parliamentary diplomacy, which is a key tool uh, designed to strengthen uh, links between parliaments. We need to see support uh, for uh, groups of friendship and uh, existing parliamentary processes. As I'm speaking to you today, our country is now uh, starting work on the building of its new parliament with uh, Chinese support. And this is a, a success of, of parliamentary diplomacy and indeed political engagement. And it's our responsibility to ensure that um, conflict resolution and prevention is effective. And we need to fund it and we need to support these efforts, dealing with the risk factors that lead to outbreaks of violence. We need to use uh, conflict management techniques to try to deal with priorities before conflicts arise. We need to believe in our power, in our force, because parliaments authorize the executive branch to undertake hostilities. And that's why parliaments must focus on the importance of dialogue and negotiation that can help build bridges between different parliaments. We need to support countries in difficulty. We need to support peace initiatives. And we express solidarity with all victims, without exception. The Republic of Guinea has a peaceful tradition uh, with a traditional respect for the UN Charter's values. And at the, uh, in conclusion, I'd like to thank uh, the IPU for all of their support to transitional countries, including the Republic of Guinea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, the distinguished representative of Eswatini. Your Excellency Pre President of the IPU, General Secretary, distinguished delegates, honorable members of the Assembly, may I take this opportunity to extend our appreciation to the President of the IPU and congratulate her for being elected to undertake this mammoth task. We are deeply honored to address this extinct gathering of the 148th IPU Assembly under the theme, Parliamentary Diplomacy, Building Bridges for Peace and Understanding. This theme resonates profoundly with the challenges and opportunities we face in our world today. These are marked by the profound impact of issues such as the lingering effects of COVID-19 pandemic, climate-related disasters, escalating competitions, tensions and conflicts in various corners of the globe. Ironically, at the precise time that the world needs broad consensus, solidarity and singularity of, of focus, opposite has seemed to be the case. Discord, mistrust, wars and inward-looking nationalism. There is no better time than this to advance and deepen diplomacy for the sake of humanity and the, and the planet. Engagement, resolution of differences and dialogue are the pillars of our societies and indeed our humanity, thus diplomacy be it 
at global, regional, local levels must be grounded in these. Our global and regional structures must be revitalized, moving away from a cynical double standards of providing general support for countries in need, respecting sovereignty and acknowledging the first lines of action that each nation offers. The kingdom of Eswatini may seem not a big country, but we bring to this assemble our unique per perspective and experiences about dialogue and um, the main tool in diplomacy. While relative homogeneous population and a history characterized by peace, we have navigated through changing times using peaceful means and resolving our differences and our system of governance, which we'll call Tingulda, is based on dual structure of traditional and parliamental governance with the monarch as the head of state. It reflects our commitment to preserving our traditions while embracing progress. It entrenches the culture of consultation and representation, not on the basis of worth but on the basis of, of individual merit as seen and defined by the people at the lowest administrative unit all the way to the parliamentary constituency. Our annual and constitutional mandated dialogue forum called Sibaya or the People's Parliament provides a platform for the public to express freely their challenges, needs and hopes directly to the monarchy. The tradition underscores our commitment to listening to the voices of our people and incorporating their perspectives into our decision-making processes. In our world today, we need a less of the diplomacy that is driven by power and more focus on the quest for mutual solutions in this regard, we must take seriously the voice of Africa and other regions of the world that have called for the reform of the United Nations, especially critical Security Council, to make it more representative of our world today and expand participation and decision making. Indeed, the UN remains our only truly uh, multilateral uh, platform uh, for our main hope for deepening diplomacy on the challenges that confront us. In conclusion, Madam President, let us, commit, let us commit ourselves to advancing diplomacy as a force for positive ch uh, change guided by the principles of dialogue, cooperation and mutual respect. I thank you. Thank you for your statement. Next on our agenda is the representative of Ukraine. Sir, you have the floor. Mr. Chairman, distinguished colleagues, uh, right now signals of air alert are going through our country as well as yesterday one week, one month, one year ago. Only for last week, Russia sent more than 200 missiles and more than seven guided air bombs to our civilian buildings and energy facilities. Right now, hundreds, thousands of civilians without electricity. But I want to say on behalf of Ukrainian people, Russia tried to shut down lights in our houses, but they never will shut down in our souls. Ukraine people have continued to heroically resist Russian aggression standing up for the entry civilized democratic world. It will be impossible without the courage of our soldiers, but without the strength position of our allies of supporting Ukraine. We are very thankful for all your military and financial support. Ukraine has been at war for 745 days since Russia's full-scale invasion. And we have been fighting for our freedom for 3,690 days since uh, 2014. 
those and thousands of our brothers and sisters lost their lives for our freedom and independence. Numerous international human rights monitoring and investigative bodies have documented ample evidence of widespread willful killings, arbitrary detention, and forced disappearance, tortures, and ill treatment commitment by Russian occupiers. Journalists, human rights defenders, and defense lawyers continue to face interference and persecution. Russia compels protect persons from the occupied territories to serve in its military, which constitutes a brave breach of international humanitarian law and war crime. The Ukrainian prisoners of war and civilians in Russian detention are being tortured and inhumanely treated. Ukrainian children forcibly transferred or deported to the Russian Federation and being indoctrinated or adopted into Russian families. All this violence of international law from Russia side need to receive strong response from international society. In this regard, we would like to present peace formula by the President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky. The Ukrainian peace formula is planned for peace that could prevent threats of use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear state and threats to the safety of nuclear power plants, the use of anger as weapon, and the undermining of energy security. It rather addresses the huge damage to ecology and the environment, the abuse and torture of captured military and civilian personnel, mass forced deportation, numerous war crimes and war damages. The peace formula has already become an international ecosystem. Today, it's a holistic structure whose elements are closely interrelated. Just comprehensive and lasting peace is only possible through collective will and collective action. Responsible states that respect international law must remain united and commitment to saving the world. War can only be prevented by providing Ukraine with reliable multilateral security guarantees. Implementing the peace formula will lay the foundation for stopping tyranny in the future. We emphasize that Vladimir Zelensky peace formula is grounded in the key principle of the UN Charter and international law, as well as respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries within their international recognized borders. It's crucial that as many countries as possible support this plan. After all, isolating Russia will change the global situation in parallel with Ukraine's success on the battlefield. In this context, I would like to draw your attention to the Global Peace Summit, a gathering of world leaders committed to the rapid establishment of a just, lasting and comprehensive peace. We believe that this summit will take place soon, this year. Ukrainians are extremely grateful to the IPU members by adopting resolutions at the 144th and 145th assemblies, strongly condemned Russia war of aggression against Ukraine and called on it to withdraw its forces from Ukrainian territory. We are confident that the international parliament community can make a significant contribution to achieving the aims of the peace formula. Only through joint efforts and pressure on Russia in all possible international formats can we achieve our ultimate goal, achievement of a just comprehensive and lasting peace in Ukraine based on the UN Charter. This is why we call on the member of IPU to join Ukraine's peace formula and the Global Peace Summit. Thank you for support Ukraine and thank you for your attention. Thank you for your statement and thank you very much for keeping up with time. Next on my list is the Honorable Member from Uganda. Followed by the distinguished member from Capo Verde. Uh, thank you, Chair. The President of IPU, the delegates in your respective capacities, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to share with you some experience that we have had as Uganda, because Uganda has suffered from war, and as I speak now, Uganda is one of the biggest host of refugees in Africa. We started hosting refugees after the Second World War. We got the Polish refugees. Over 6,000 refugees were hosted in Uganda. In the 1950s and 60s, 
we got a large number of refugees from Rwanda, the Tusi who were being massacred by then. And uh, in the 1970s, it was our turn as Ugandans to go to exile, and we were hosted by Tanzania. After the war of liberating Uganda, we continued having internal conflicts and disagreements that led to another guerrilla war of 1980 to 1985. So we have had a huge share of war. When we are talking about war, I am one of those who, have, who has experienced war. War is bad. It is terrible. War is a criminal. War is ungodly. And I don't think God designed us for war on this planet. So we have had, right now as I speak, they are suffering people from the Democratic Republic of Congo, from South Sudan. We have refugees from Eritrea. We have refugees from Somalia. We have over 180,000 that we are hosting as I speak today. So this is a crisis. We talk about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. How can we really realize the sustainable development goals when we are at war? Even those nations that are powerful, they are spending a hell of money to kill human lives. Is that really why God gave you the wealth and knowledge and skills for you to form artificial intelligence that is heartless? These machines that know they have no human heart, they are the ones killing us. I think we have to reflect. So looking at this theme, Mr. Chairman, it is very timely. When we are, IPU is coming up with the parliamentary diplomacy and building bridges for peace and understanding. This is extremely relevant, and I don't think it can only be held in this year, this will go on for many years because this is what we really have to do if we are to sustain peace in this world. IPU must be at the center stage of championing peace because we are products of a democratic process, peaceful process. Now, we, are, we, we will be very vulnerable if we allow the powerful nations, if we allow those who feel they have the might to conquer and subjugate the vulnerable. We shall be vulnerable. So it is our duty as IPU to continue pushing for the peace in this world, to continue pushing and condemning the acts of war. Because I was so disappointed yesterday. I could not believe that we, we did not pass a resolution. How can we fail? What is it that is so difficult? Why couldn't we have another round? Should we really say it is one off? We could come to an understanding and have another round, and then we make our voice. And I appreciate that the United Nations has made a voice of ceasefire in Gaza. I appreciate that what the nations have done and realized this brutality that is going on in this world. So I salute IPU, and I, may, I have a proposal that, uh, yes, we must go into the root causes of these conflicts. Because before we go to condemn, we must understand why, why are people at war? What is causing this war? And what can we do about it? So I would propose that we have a select committee of IPU that should focus on peace and conflict reconciliation in this world. I beg to move, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your statement. And next is a colleague from Capo Verde, followed by Madagascar. Capo Verde, you have the floor. Um, we Good morning. Your Excellencies, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Secretary-General, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
I am delighted to be here today representing the Cape Verdean Parliament, sharing our understanding on one of the greatest challenges of today, peace and understanding between nations. This important and strategic conference on the theme parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding, with the participation of uh, over 170 IPU member parliaments, is an opportunity to deepen dialogue on peace, tolerance, and understanding between nations, and the role of parliaments in promoting peace. As mentioned in an introductory note to this conference, peace is an end in itself, but it is also a fundamental condition for tackling global development challenges, such as the Sustainable Development Goals. Currently, many countries around the world are involved in armed conflicts, while political radicalization, populism and hate speech are on the rise. Technological advances fundamental to the development of societies in many ways have been used as a way to make conflicts more intense and more lethal, with devastating consequences for communities. In addition, unilateral measures adopted by some states have threatened global security and jeopardized the credibility of multilateral institutions. IPU, since its foundation, has defended dialogue as a fundamental tool for resolving conflicts peacefully, encouraging parliaments to adopt measures to promote peace, such as establishing parliamentary friendship groups and participating in dialogue and exchange <coughs> programs. Parliaments, being the home of democracy, play a crucial role in promoting peace by promoting dialogue, respect, tolerance, inclusion, equal opportunities, respect for fundamental rights and other uh, policies that lead to the strengthening of democracy and the rule of law. Within the scope of its powers, the Cape Verdean Parliament has been an active player in promoting peace, exercising its role, uh, its oversighting role, and uh, uh, supervising government policies and respect for human rights, fundamental freedoms and guarantees of citizens, in accordance with the country's constitution and the International Declaration of Human Rights, the promotion of dialogue, gender equality, access to education and health for all, the promotion of the environment and the oceans, since building peaceful societies also involves creating economic opportunities and access to health and education for all, without discrimination of any kind. With regard to gender equality, it is important to note that the Cape Verdean Parliament has been working to strengthen gender-sensitive budget monitoring capacities and uh, to mainstream gender policies. We are building an open parliament, creating mechanisms for communication, interaction and citizen participation in the country's political life while at the same time strengthening the transparency and public accountability of political office holders. Standardly, the Cape Verdean Parliament has been an active player in various international fora within the framework of the IPU, the African Union, ECOWAS, CPLP, La, Confra La Francophonie, always promoting dialogue as the best way to resolve conflicts. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, War only brings death, destruction and regression. We cannot forget the suffering, destruction and collapse caused by the two world wars that the world has lived through and which will forever go down on the annals of history as the darkest period that man has lived through. As we gather here today in Geneva for the 148th IPU conference, and in view of the increasing tension between the superpowers that possess no nuclear weapons, I believe that the main concern of this conference should be to prevent the escalation of tensions. Mr. Chair, I end saying that uh, I restate the commitment of our parliament and our country towards peace and tolerance to, through dialogue and international cooperation. 
uh, parliaments may play a significant role in promoting peace and security in the world. Thank you so much. Next is the distinguished representative of Madagascar, followed by the distinguished representative of Palestine. You have the floor. Monsieur le Mr. President, oh, Speaker of the Namibian Assembly presiding over our Assembly, fellow parliamentarians, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to address this august assembly today to make uh, a contribution on behalf of the Senate of Madagascar and to give you our perspectives on our theme, parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. That is indeed a vast subject it is an ambitious goal. Now, at a time when we find ourselves of crisis, conflicts, human catastrophes throughout the world, this is a situation that speaks to us and which involves our noble organization all the more. And here we are, the year of our 135th anniversary. Thus it is that we find ourselves facing an extremely worrying situation. It is vital that we parliamentarians, legitimate representatives of our fellow citizens, work hand in hand. We have to cooperate to find ways and means of solving all these problems. This 148th assembly of the IPU is of vital importance. If we wish to remain faithful to the spirit of our founding fathers, we want to ensure that we have a peaceful settlement of disputes through mediation for democracy. One thing is certain, our peoples want peace Everybody benefits from peace. The message of the Senate of Madagascar is absolutely clear. My brothers and sisters, parliamentarians, it is our duty to raise our respective governments' awareness of their need to fight for peace, to fight against hunger, contagious disease and pandemics, droughts, the cost of living, as well as poverty. They must make those fights and not fight our neighbors. We must do everything we can to silence weapons and to promote dialogue through diplomacy. We are but one on this planet and we must realize that as humanity, we are increasingly th threatened by global warming. This is a particularly acute problem for Madagascar. We are among the first victims of climate change, whereas our net emissions of greenhouse gases represent a very, very small part of world emissions, some 0.1% of the total. Thus, in the interests of fairness, we would like to see an increase in the funding for the protection of our country's biodiversity. This was an appeal we made at COP28. 
in Dubai. We would like to appeal strongly to the industrialized countries to please honor the commitment they made to fund developing countries. They promised $100 billion at the Paris, the moment of the Paris Agreements in 2015 in order to help developing countries meet the challenges and deal with climate change. In this respect, Madagascar is true to its word and has implemented its climate action policy, this in keeping with the timeline set by the Paris Agreement. We would further like to encourage you to raise the economic players in your countries to bear in mind the opportuni opportunities for investment in Madagascar. Don't forget that we are the world's first producer and exporter of vanilla. We are also the second producer and first exporter of cloves. This with respect to the figures for 2023, and we have other areas of possible interest, industry, mining, agribusiness, and tourism. Mr. President, Madam Secretary, my fellow parliamentarians, it is our wish that we might work together to build a prosperous future for our planet this as is laid out in the 2030 Agenda. We must all do what we can to work with the decision-making bodies in our countries to meet SDG 16. That is to say, we must do what we can to ensure that we have peaceful, inclusive societies working in the interests of sustainable development. And as my time is up, I do think that given the difficulties we face with respect to negotiating peace, given the number of crises we face, our organization would do well to set itself a very clear schedule and of monitoring mechanism in order to see to what extent negotiations are succeeding. Thus, as is our custom, we will have tangible and realistic results that are quantifiable and evidence-based. By way of conclusion, let me simply try to inspire you. Let's not be overwhelmed by our challenges. Let us meet them head on because that will only make us stronger. Here's to parliamentary solidarity. Long live the IPU. Your Excellencies, I thank you for your attention. Up with time. Next, the distinguished representative of Palestine, followed by the representative of Benin. In that order, thank you. Say that or say that. Ladies and gentlemen, while we were discussing yesterday parliamentary diplomacy and while we were arguing about adding a word here or removing a word there, hundreds of children died in Gaza. They starved to death or they were burned and the Israeli occupation continued its genocide against unarmed Palestinian civilians, killing more children, women, either with bombs or starvation. Let me say it plainly. Enough of this fake democracy that hasn't managed so far to put an end to the genocide. It has been more than 170 days, and the world has been watching the killing, the destruction and starvation without lifting a finger. 
It has been 170 days of disgrace for this so-called civilized world. I'm not going to mention the numbers of victims, the dozens of thousands of martyrs, injured, detainees, dis disappeared, and the millions of displaced, not only in Gaza, but also in the West Bank and Jerusalem. You are all familiar with the figures. And I'm not going to go through the statistics and reports of international organizations about the destruction caused by the Israeli terrorism, which has turned the Gaza Strip into an uninhabitable zone. Because simply this will not make any difference if the bloodshed that has been ongoing for six months did not manage to wake the conscience of the world. All I want to say is that the blood and lives of our children and women and youth is no less valuable than the lives of the other peoples of the world, because we are all humans worthy of dignity and justice. And let me reassure you as parliamentarians about what happened here yesterday. Don't be mistaken and think that adopting an emergency item would have been able to stop the war or restore peace in Palestine and the Middle East. We are dealing with a rogue state that is exercising state terrorism and completely ignoring international laws, instruments, and international organiza organizations. We are dealing with an Israeli leadership that is willing to take the Middle East to hell in order to remain in power and evade prosecution for committing crimes of corruption. They are doing their best to prolong this war for years to come. Even more so, they are willing to start a regional war in the area in order to expand their occupation and implement their plans. Ladies and gentlemen, the worst thing that a people can experience in the 21st century is death by starvation. Systematic starvation. This is much more cruel than dying under the bombs or missiles. We commend all the voices that have called to put an end to this humanitarian tragedy in Gaza and to allow humanitarian aid to end the famine. But here I would like to say without any shame, yes, we want our children to remain alive and not starve to death, but also we do not want them to die on a full stomach. We want our children to remain alive and not starve, but we do not want them to die on a full stomach. Our priority must be a permanent ceasefire and putting an end to this big massacre that Israel is planning to commit in Rafah, where more than 1.5 million Palestinians have been forced into a tiny geographic area where they will be massacred and displaced in order to empty the Gaza Strip from its residents. This is an old plan that Israel has been trying to implement for decades. Ladies and gentlemen, while most countries of the world have remained silent in the face of this massacre committed by Israel, with the blessing and support of some countries that claim to protect the rights and freedoms of individuals, South Africa has led an international legal movement and action with the support of brothers and friends from the free world. South Africa, which is the symbol of freedom and fighting apartheid, it has brought Israel to justice and held it accountable for committing the crime of genocide. And here, on behalf of the Palestinian people, we want to thank South Africa and all the friends and brothers for these efforts. They have given us hopes that there are some people in this world who are willing to speak truth to power and say no to injustice and per persecution. Ladies and gentlemen, this aggression against the Palestinian people is only one series and a long tragedy that has been ongoing for 75 years. And unfortunately, it will not be the last episode. The end of this tragedy cannot be done with temporary solutions or short-term uh, ceasefires or truth. 
This needs a fair and comprehensive solution for the Palestinian cause and putting an end to the occupation on the basis of the two-state solution and giving the Palestinian people its legitimate rights to establish an independent state along the borders of June 1967 with Jerusalem as a capital. We and the entire world have had enough of the cycle of violence and bloodshed. It is high time for the world to take a serious decision and to reform the international system in order to achieve justice for all the vulnerable in the world and to retrieve this power that was given to some countries to use the veto unjustly against the will of all the peoples of the world to provide cover to the forces of darkness and prevent a ceasefire to protect an unarmed people. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, to all those who think that the Palestinian people will be defeated and abandon their land, we say, history has proven that injustice does not last and that the right must prevail. We are a people determined to recover our freedom, and through our resistance, we will make history, not only in Palestine, because our struggle for freedom will expand and will help free those of you who have become slaves to the settler colonial ideology. Thank you for listening. Statement. Next, the distinguished representative of Benin, followed by Maima. Monsieur le Président. Distinguished Speaker of uh, the Namibian National Assembly, acting on behalf of the President of IPU, Madam Representative of the Secretary General, Speakers of uh, the Assemblies uh, of the World. Heads of delegation, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, allow me to express my sincere gratitude to the Interparliamentary Union for this opportunity to share with you a few thoughts about uh, the theme parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. I'm very honoured to take the floor before this August Assembly on behalf of the Speaker of our National Assembly, Mr. Louis Boigny Lavonou. So I'm honoured to talk to you about uh, the theme that has been chosen for this 148th Assembly. Before I go on, I also wished to express very humbly and with great respect uh, how I feel for all of the innocent victims who have been talked about in so many terrorist attacks, so many dreadful conflicts that continue to occur around the world. As you know, constant dialogue between parliaments strengthen parliamentary diplomacy and make a significant contribution to resolving uh, the conflicts that our current world faces. And as representatives of our peoples, we have a duty to adopt laws for the good of our peoples. 
and to help to build a more peaceful and harmonious world. Parliamentary diplomacy complements traditional diplomacy and plays a vital role in strengthening international relations by building bridges and promoting dialogue among parliaments and peoples. We can support the peaceful resolution of conflicts, encourage international cooperation and promote mutual respect among nations. As we witness great tension and division, it's vital for us as parliamentarians to underscore the values of peace, dialogue and understanding, to work hand in hand to overcome our differences and find common solutions. I believe we can help create a fairer and more harmonious world. The 148th Interparliamentary Assembly is a wonderful opportunity to share views and experiences, to promote understanding and permanent contacts among parliamentarians are an effective tool to rise to the common challenges we all face. Through our meetings, we can put an end to conflicts, even nip them in the bud and prevent them through structured political dialogue. Unfortunately, there are too many failures in traditional diplomacy and therefore it's our duty as parliamentarians to go beyond political and national barriers to try to pool our efforts to build a more peaceful world. Therefore, we should use our good offices to facilitate dialogue among uh, different uh, parties to conflicts. But quite apart from the efforts uh, that we can make and that each of our parliaments make to try to consolidate peace, it's also very important to reform our national uh, laws to reflect uh, common uh, and new climate threats and security threats. We need to support interfaith dialogue, including uh, among uh, traditional uh, religions uh, like voodoo in my country, Benin. This uh, interfaith dialogue, an intercultural dialogue, can draw from these common values and help find uh, solutions for the education of our young people to promote a culture of peace, tolerance and mutual respect. Parliamentary initiatives designed to support intercultural understanding may help us break a cycle of hate and educate um, future generations to create a more peaceful world. And to conclude, I just wish to say that in this uh, attempt to seek uh, peace, we must help women get involved more in this process because of their key role in peace building. In Benin, we've fully understood that and incorporated that into our methods of work in our parliament. About 27% of parliamentarians are women in our National Assembly. Thank you very much. Thank you for your statement. Let's, let's move on. Next, the representative of Myanmar. Thank you very much. Good morning, chairpersons, 
and dear parliamentarians, and it is, uh, I'm the representative from committee representing Union Parliament, CRPH, Myanmar. It is my honor to take part in this assembly and I acknowledge the IBU's good offices. In today's war, armed conflicts are increasing in severity, including my country, Myanmar. These conflicts cause damage to regional and global economy, security, peace, and predominantly harm civilians physically and every area of their lives. The advent of such conflicts demonstrates failure by the state and non-state actors to respect international laws and obligations. The length and intensity of and the inability to stop or lessen armed conflicts as early as possible means that the challenges to peace, human rights, and development increase exponentially. Diplomacy wards are important, but can be enhanced by collective, collectively and timely interventions. The question for the global parliamentary family is, how can we parliamentarians help resolve this problem happening in our world? What more can we do to improve peace, to reduce crisis, and to help our people I look forward to exploring this question during this assembly. But I do know that the parliamentarians engage in diplomacy every day, but we still need to promote our contribution in diplomacy. Like many people from conflict-affected countries, the people of Myanmar ask for your help to reduce the pain being perpetrated upon them by the brutal military honda in Myanmar. The needs are to support their efforts in ending the illegal military rule in Myanmar and in building a peaceful society which respects international human rights and law. They are resolute in the advance of their agreed political goals of civilian government and a federal democratic state. The IBU has given exceptional support, standing shoulder to shoulder with the parliamentarians. Since the military coup in 2021, 2.7 million people have been forced to displace by the military hunters onslaught of air and artillery strikes, executions and killings, rapes, torture, arbitrary detentions, and forced disappearances and persecution. At the present, nearly 19 million people are now in need of humanitarian assistance. That include six million children. The military Honda recent announcement to uplift the conscription law forced recruitment of young people by military, accelerated displacement, house-to-house -house intimidation, corruption, and fear with the number fleeing growing exponentially. We, the parliamentarians, are working hand-in-hand -hand with the country's stakeholders to find a solution to the current political situation using our parliamentary mandates and exercising parliamentary diplomacy. The disintegrating military Honda has lost several territories and troops by the nationwide anti-coup resistance. The democratic forces, including the elected lawmakers, are securing our common goals to lay the groundwork to create a peaceful society for all Myanmar people. I'm confident that this 148 IBU will strengthen our already strong relationship and find a path towards strengthened parliamentary diplomacy that inspires us 
to continue our work to achieve a peaceful, prosperous, and federal democratic Myanmar. I thank you. Thank you very much. This is three minutes. Okay. I'm taking the next list now, and our distinguished participants are expected to three to speak for not more than three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, next is the Parliamentary Assembly of the Community of the Portuguese-speaking countries. Distinguished representative, you have the floor. Muito obrigado. Well, thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Sua Excelência, Senhor. Your Excellency, uh, President of the IPU, uh, Excellency, uh, Secretary General of the IPU, speakers and uh, ladies and gentlemen here present, dear guests, I speak to you here today on behalf and representing uh, the President of the Senate of uh, Guinea Equatorial, Equatorial Guinea, and uh, uh, Excellency Teresa Eswangong for reasons associated to its agenda, is not able to be here present with you. According to the statutes of the CPLP, one of its objectives is to contribute to peace and reinforcement of democracy for the good governments and consolidation of uh, rule of law, promote and defend human rights, namely of children, adolescents, elderly, ec gender equity, and fight any gender, any gender of uh, racism and xenophobia. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this uh, parliamentary diplomacy is a duty. The parliaments adopt laws with a vision in order to protect the national rights, but also international rights. Negotiating all with the objective to reach world peace. And in this sense, the General Assembly of CPLP adhered to the objectives of the IPU, trying to find a world balance in order to find peace in those countries who live in conflict or post-conflict, respecting human rights, gender equality, in representation of the political institutions, but also non-interference uh, in internal affairs of each of the states. And in conclusion, Chair, the parliaments of the CPLP, we uh, request the modification of the statutes of the IPU for its adoption an introduction of Portuguese as uh, official language, working language, of the IPU. This request will be sent officially to the presidency of the, of, uh, to the presidency of the IPU. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for keeping up with time. Next on my list is the representative of Asian Parla Assembly, Parliamentary Assembly. You have the floor. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, Excellence et Je. In the name of God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving me the floor. Ramadan Karim, Nooruz Mubarak. The theme brought up for general debate at this assembly is of critical importance for parliamentary perspectives. Considering the grave humanitarian tragedy unfolded in the Gaza Strip. However, due to time constraint, I try to draw, try to draw your attention to a couple of concise points as follows. 
The central point being discussed here relates to peace and understanding under the umbrella of parliamentary diplomacy. While it is our six months, six, our last meeting in Angola, and we have not been able to pace even one step further, witnessing massacre of women and children in the Gaza Strip. Also, the United Nations system proved to be unable to undertake any functional initiative in stopping the crimes in the besieged blockade, though it, ad it adopted a resolution after six months since the horrendous crimes committed by the Zionist entity in Gaza, but our experience shows that without a strong will behind such resolution for practical actions, such resolution like other ones proved to be of no avail. Parliamentary diplomacy that initiated over 100 years ago and channeled into one of the long-lasting parliamentary organizations in the world not only has not been able to do any practical action in order to find a solution to the unfolding crimes in the war-ravaged enclave, but it seems it has even lost its core function to adopt an emergency item in favor of the innocent civilians who are exposed not only to heavy bombardment, but also to dire pressure of famine and hungry situation. In the course of consideration of the emergency items, one of our colleagues said we could not return home without a getting fruitful result from our meeting in Gaza in Geneva. What he said was true. Yes, what we have for our people when we return home. Don't you think that it's high time to make a reconsideration of functional structures of our organizations? If no concrete measures is taken to bring this horrendous war crime into a halt, you can be assured that not only peace and understanding, but also security as the main prerequisite of life will be also threatened. Asha Gaza, Asha Palestine, vive Gaza, vive la Palestine. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Long live Palestine. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. For your statement. And next on my list is the Asian Interparliamentary Assembly. Colleague, you have the floor. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in today's world, we are confronted with numerous challenges. And despite our efforts to foster peace and inclusivity, conflicts, discrimination, and exclusion persist in many parts of the globe, exacerbating social and economic disparities. Inequality and exclusion are pervasive issues globally, regionally, and nationally. Exclusion often stems from various factors, including gender, disability, age, economic status, education, belief systems, and cultural background. Those most vulnerable are often at the intersection of multiple forms of exclusion, and that includes young women and women with disabilities. IPA has long been committed to advancing women political participation and leadership through the establishment of the women parliamentarians of IPA. And furthermore, recognizing the importance of youth inclusion, IPA has recently established the young parliamentarians of IPA to ensure that the voices of our youth are heard and represented across regional processes. In promoting coexistence, harmony shall be emphasized amidst diversity. Parliaments play a crucial role in promoting peaceful and inclusive societies serving as arenas for debating, dialogue, and passing laws and policies that uphold principles of equality and inclusivity. As we celebrate International Women's Day this month, it is essential to recognize that despite progress, significant disparities persist. Women still encounter obstacles hindering their full participation in social, economic, and political realms. By prioritizing investments in women's education, healthcare, economic empowerment, 
and leadership development will not only unleash their pot potential, but also ignite progress across diverse sectors. As part of this commitment, IPA is developing a regional plan of action and implementation framework on women, political participation and leadership, incorporating of strong focus on women, peace and security. And this initiative aims to overcome barriers to women's political engagement while promoting their significant role in peace building efforts. Empowering women and ensuring that their equal access to opportunities catalyze change, spur innovation, stimulate economic growth, and enhance social cohesion. Thus, investing in women is not just about equal gender equality, but also a strategic imperative for advancing towards a more equitable, prosperous, and peaceful world. Thank you. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for your statement. Thank you very much. Next on our list is the, rep the representative of Unite Parliamentary Network for Global Health. Colleague, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning to you all. It is an honor to be here in Geneva at the 148th General Assembly of the IPU on behalf of the Unite Parliamentarians Network for Global Health. As a network of current and former legislators from 110 countries committed to global health, we call on all of you to join our global efforts. Back in the late 18th century, in the UK, a British Member of Parliament, the Honorable William Wilberford, conducted a vigorous campaign against slave trade that led to the Slave Trade Act of 1807. That marked the beginning of the end of the transatlantic trade and set a precedent for human rights that resonate until today. Honorable Wilberforce said, and I quote, that a private faith that does not act in the face of oppression is no faith at all. What he was saying is that talk and words are important but actions are even more important. Your actions as parliamentarians make a difference, but not to act is also a political choice. So the question is, how do you as parliamentarians, as representatives of citizens of your countries, want to be seen in the history books? How do you, each of you, choose to act? What will be your greatest achievement as members of parliament. How will you help change your country and the world? In a time when so many citizens question the basic merits of democracy as a model of governance, this is precisely when we need parliamentarians the most. We need each of you to step up. We know that parliamentary democracy and parliamentary diplomacy can accelerate the de development of your countries. Parliamentary diplomacy can make the citizens of your country healthier. And parliamentary diplomacy can actually lead to world peace. In two months from now, the World Health Assembly is going to convene here in Geneva, just across the street. And governments and parliamentarians are, come to are going to come together to vote here on the pandemic accord. So what is history going to look upon us and see? Are we going to be the ones who fail to protect our citizens from the upcoming global health threats? Or are we going to be the ones that were able to come together in one moment of time and collectively prevent the next pandemic? That's why we call on all of you to join the Unite, Join Your Delegation campaign. Make sure, even if you're a minority parliamentarian or a majority parliamentarian, it doesn't matter. Make sure you are joining your governmental representation and the, your country's delegation at the next World Health Assembly here in Geneva. Make sure that you convey the message of the importance of getting the pandemic accord approved. We can make the world a healthier and safer place to all. Together, we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your statement.
Next, the representative of the Global Fund to fight, to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Colleague, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon, honorable members of parliament. The Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria is a permanent observer at the assembly, and we're grateful for the opportunity to participate in this general debate. We're the largest multilateral grant funder for health system strengthening, including building stronger laboratory networks, supply chains, data systems, surveillance systems, uh, and other key elements of strong health systems. Our new grant cycle began this year with over 120 countries eligible to receive funds. This was made possible by the su success of our seventh replenishment, which many of the countries represented at this assembly supported. The concept note for this debate rightly highlights that peace is a fundamental condition for addressing global development challenges, such as the Sustainable Development Goals, including SDG 3, health and well-being for all. Countries today are grappling with a web of interconnected crises, from the enduring impact of COVID-19 and the risk of future pandemics, to climate change, conflicts, mounting debt, and the erosion of human rights. All of these challenges exacerbate the difficulties of fighting infectious diseases, particularly imperiling the most vulnerable populations. As we are witnessing in too many parts of the world today, Armed conflict especially threatens access to the health care services everyone deserves. Often, health facilities and medical supplies are destroyed. For example, in Ukraine, more than 1,200 health, health facilities have been damaged or destroyed since the beginning of the war, including three tuberculosis hospitals. In addition, health care workers risk death and injury, populations are displaced, malnutrition weakens immune systems, Lack of food makes it difficult or impossible to take certain medications. The impacts are devastating. The sad reality is that typically during armed conflict, more people die from disease than from bullets and bombs. To provide extra assistance during periods of crisis, the Global Fund has dispersed over 130 million US dollars from our emergency fund. In recent years, this has included additional funding to Ukraine, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka, and that funding has been over and above the core grant funding uh, that each of those countries receives during our regular three-year grant cycle. Many other countries facing armed conflict are also receiving grants from the Global Fund. These funds help address significant needs during conflict, generators for laboratories, mobile health clinics, medicines and diagnostic equipment, supporting community-led organizations that help displace people uh, get safely linked to health services and needed medications, uh, providing food to combat malnutrition, locating appropriate accommodations for patients with infectious conditions. The needs are enormous. The Global Fund will continue our ongoing work to build strong and resilient systems for health that address both diseases killing people now, like HIV, TB, malaria, and COVID, as well as the future pandemic threats that we all know will come. But progress will always be severely threatened where there is armed conflict and aggression and where efforts to sustain peace fail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is the representative of the uh, Baltic Assembly. You have the floor. Honorable Chairman, dear colleagues, uh, as the Vice President of uh, Baltic Assembly, I have an honor uh, to represent here today the parliamentarians of three Baltic countries, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. Our interparliamentary organization, uh, and I'm stand standing here today after a break uh, of several years, and I think that I have full right to speak here about uh, parliamentary uh, diplomacy based on our uh, Baltic experience and uh, about opportunities of parliamentary diplomacy and also about limitations. Uh, about 35 years ago, the people of the Baltic states occupied at that time by the Soviet Union showed to the whole world based on the principles of parliamentary diplomacy, the order, uh, that it can, it can uh, be changed, this order, 
uh, and uh, we change this uh, not only in our countries, but uh, even in the some part of the world. At that time, firstly, by jointly organized solidarity action, the Baltic Way, in which two million people standing hand by hand connected the capitals of our countries, we signaled the rest of the world that we want to regain our independence by following the path of parliamentary diplomacy. As a next step, a few years later, by organizing democratic elections, we managed to bring the process started in the Baltics to the de facto and de jure independence of our countries, regained through parliamentary diplomacy. This made it possible to make our people's lives more fulfilling, ones in which human rights are respected, laws are democratically adopted and followed, in which governance in all branches of power is organized on the principles of democracy. In the previous days, one of the speakers from this podium already said, parliamentary democracy begins with democratic parliamentary elections. There are no democratic elections, there is no parliamentary democracy as such. And I can only agree with that. In the context of today's geopolitical events, it can be said more than uh, 30 years ago, we Baltic states were lucky to take advantage that not, uh, that, uh, uh, in so not so long period of time when our neighboring country, Russia, also tried to follow the path of democracy development and at least respected the principles of parliamentary diplomacy in its foreign policy. Unfortunately, that period has long since ended, and the biggest sufferer from it is, is now Ukraine. As I said before, there is no parliamentary diplomacy without democratic elections. We parliamentarians of the Baltic states, based on our historical experience, have already told you, dear colleagues, many times in various international forums, that today parliamentary diplomacy is a foreign word in Russia, and we must not forget that. I know that, that it's sometimes hard to understand that diplomacy alone will not stop the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Demo, de, uh, diplomacy has serious limitations when addressing Russia or similar countries. But parliamentary diplomacy has a major role to play in building bridges for peace in which our Baltic regions, uh, region means ensuring unselfish help to Ukraine. It is our power to help other countries to understand the role of supporting Ukraine. We parliamentarians from Baltics uh, who know very well such regimes like ruling today in Russia and in Belarus, how to shed light on the aggressive and often violent activities of Russia and the support to them coming to from Belarus. But unfortunately, there is still not enough politicians with such experience and understanding. In the Baltic states, we know well that it is not possible to form any kind of trustful relations with Russia current ruling regime. So, this is a clear limitation of our parliamentary diplomacy for us. This is an added value that the Baltic Assembly and the Baltic Parliaments can bring to international efforts to promote peace and international security. Russia started to withdraw its troops from the Baltic states only 30 years ago. Thank for this you. reason, we completely understand why Ukrainians are determined to get every Russian soldier out of their country and why they are committed to regaining every meter of their land. Do there is conclude, no life. Please, one minute. Uh, one second. There is no light, no freedom, and no development under Russian control and influence. Dear colleagues, we must help Ukraine and we must keep Ukraine on international agenda. While we allow countries to grossly violate international law, there will not be peace for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on. Um, may I request honorable colleagues to lower your voices? I know there's a lot of the discussion going on, but out of respect to those who are speaking, I think we need to listen to each other, give them the attention they deserve, and I, let's lower our voices. You have been doing so well so far, but the last few minutes, I've been observing you having open conversation. That is not acceptable. Thank you. Next on my list is the parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Colleague, you have the floor. Your Excellencies, I thank you very much for the opportunity to give a brief statement from parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, let me first greet you in the language of my country, Aotearoa New Zealand, 
Uh, Erangatirama, Ngahoefa, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenatatakoto. Greetings to everybody from all the four different directions of the world. Uh, you're all leaders and we honor you all. Thank you very much for your time and, and commitment to being here. Uh, from PND, we look very closely to the United Nations Charter, which in Articles 2 and 33 requires member states to resolve conflicts peacefully through, and I quote, negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to regional agencies or arrangements or other peaceful means of their own choice. Parliamentarians should do their utmost to ensure that their governments adhere to this obligation. Parliamentarians should also remind their governments of the comprehensive toolkit of mechanisms for the peaceful and just resolution of conflicts, including the UN Mediation Service, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, and the International Court of Justice. Parliamentarians should support the call of the UN Secretary General affirmed in the Luanda Declaration adopted at the IPU at its 147th Assembly that all states accept the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice in order to ensure the peaceful and just resolution of international conflicts. And we bring to you your attention the excellent handbook produced by Switzerland and six other countries on how to uh, accept the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice and what are the parliamentary measures to do so. The UN Summit of the Future in September this year provides an opportunity to promote international peace and diplomacy, including the role of the International Court of Justice, and parliamentarians should take an active role in the UN Summit and in its preparatory process. And then on the nuclear threats, threats to use nuclear weapons undermine peace, security, diplomacy and understanding. Parliamentarians can support the G20 leaders' declaration from Bali that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is inadmissible, and also to ensure implementation of the ruling from the International Court of Justice that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is generally illegal and that there exists an unconditional obligation to negotiate for their complete elimination. Our organization, Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, welcomes the opportunity to work in cooperation with you uh, and, to the, and the Interparliamentary Union in order to advance peace, common security, conflict resolution, and nuclear disarmament, especially in preparation for the UN Summit of the Future. I thank you very much. Thank you very much for that statement and for keeping time. Next is the um, Parliamentary Assembly for the Mediterranean. Distinguished representative, you have the floor. Said the uh, Ace Jessa, the uh, Said Ace Jessa, Said that said the Ro Essa, the Parliament. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, uh, representatives of national parliaments, ladies and gentlemen, greetings to you all. It a pleasure for me to uh, represent the uh, PAM uh, to the 148th Assembly of the IPU. Your work uh, reflects uh, the work of your national assemblies in the interest of peace and prosperity. The theme of this general debate is uh, timely. It allows us to take the opportunity to think of the challenges we face worldwide. I would also like to say how distressed I am at the that world situation. Let me say how much I deplore the genocide that the Palestinians are facing who are being deliberately deliberately pushed from their homes. And this uh, before the eyes of the international community, which is not uh, responding to the bloodbath. There are some 1.5 million people facing famine. That is uh, close to one half of the population of Gaza. 
it is uh, a matter of the utmost necessity that the international community act and now. Israel must be made to comply with international law. Humanitarian aid needs to be brought to the region. It is an absolute scandal that this is happening. The generations to come will be affected by this scourge, which is haunting us today. We in the PAM are all too aware that these uh, crimes are going to uh, undermine peace and security throughout the world. We therefore support all of the efforts being made by the United Nations Secretary General working towards an immediate ceasefire which must be decreed. In March uh, of this month, uh, Resolution 2728 made an appeal for a ceasefire in Ramadan. This would allow us to have a lasting ceasefire. That, in turn, would mean that the forced ex expulsions would cease and humanitarian aid could be brought in. Ladies and gentlemen, we, the members of the PAM, know all too well that there can be no peace without justice. No peace if these conflicts continue to rage. That is the situation we face today, where there are many dis difficulties uh, we still have uh, to uh, deal with colonization, and we must not forget fake news, which is propagated thanks uh, particularly to artificial intelligence. We must not uh, leave to one side the uh, threats of terrorism. These factors all uh, contribute to uh, instability in our region and in the Sahel, where there's been a number of coups. We work closely with the United Nations and are going to be participating in the UN's summit on the future. That is why we do need to do what we can now to ensure that, in, that international law and international humanitarian law are respected. We remain firmly convinced that uh, we need to find ways uh, of uh, engaging in dialogue and working together closely. We have uh, legislative frameworks available to us. Uh, it's not enough for us to just to have intra-parliamentary dialogues. We have to work with our executives. We have to work with other organizations, the private sector, the academy, and others. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Next, <clears throat> distinguished representative from the International Parliamentary Network for Education. Colleague, you have the floor. <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, it's an honour to take the floor on behalf of the International Parliamentary Network for Education. In fact, the first time that we have done so since becoming a permanent observer of the IPU in 2021. We are a network of parliamentarians from around the world who share a commitment to quality education for all. It sounds basic, the idea that we would educate every child, but more than 20 years into the 21st century, the world is still far from reaching that goal. And in fact, the prospects of reaching and achieving Sustainable Development Goal 4 become even more remote every day. That is, instead, that is because education confronts a dramatic triple crisis, one of equity inclusion, in which millions of children are still out of school, one of quality, where millions of children, even if they are in school, do not achieve the basics, and also one of relevance, where millions of children do not receive the knowledge and the skills that they need to, to thrive in today's world. And picking up the theme of the Assembly's debate this week, conflicts and crises undoubtedly make matters worse. They drive families from their homes, disrupting children's education and leaving them traumatised and unable to learn. 
And this is no incidental issue. In fact, there are 222 million children around the world caught up in crises that are in urgent need of educational support. And sadly, by and large, we fail these children because we deny them the support and funding needed to get them back into education, whether they are internally displaced or refugees. But don't think for one minute that education is just collateral damage of conflict. As we all know, in fact, schools are destroyed, books are burnt, learners are kidnapped, and teachers are killed deliberately and systematically during conflicts. And that's because the agents of war know the powerful role that education plays in building peace. A well-resourced education system can be an effective long-term preventative tool that protects, builds, and sustains peace before, after, and during conflict. Honourable members, I urge you to think that parliamentary action for peace must prioritise parliamentary action for education. Before I leave the floor, I, want to know, I know that there are millions of things that we can do to address educational challenges, but I want to share two of them with you. I'm confident that all of us in this room can read. But sadly, there are 70% of children in low and middle income countries who will never have the ability to do exactly that. Concerted action to ensure all children are in school and learn how to read is essential, and I urge you to address that. The final thing I wanted to say is that nothing destroys potential as savagely as hunger, and millions of children around the world are exactly that. They go to school hungry. Our vision is simple, it is of a child, all children in the world reading, and all children having a healthy meal at school. It's a vision which you're central to. In fact, it can't happen without your support. I urge you to commit yourself to that vision and join us in achieving a world in which all children read and all children receive a nutritious meal at school. Thank you very much for that statement. And next, the representative of the Partnership for Maternal newborn child health, you have the floor. Honourable President, distinguished uh, members of parliament, it's truly an honour to address you on behalf of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, which is the largest alliance currently in the world combining advocacy for the health and rights of women, children, and adolescents. The topic you have discussed this week, which is conflict, crisis, clearly have a tremendous impact on the health and rights of this population. And we know they are depriving young people of the opportunity to grow healthy, to have future, and become productive citizens. Honourable President, we live in a world where already maternal deaths are on the rise. We still have more than 300,000 maternal deaths every year. And clearly, the concentration of those deaths in countries that are affected by crisis and conflict is happening. In addition, the climate crisis that you have also discussed is impacting significantly the food security, the nutrition, the nutritional ability of mothers and children to grow up healthy and be productive citizens. But, Mr. President and honorable colleagues, for this assembly, there is one issue that I would really draw your attention to, and this is the issue of violation of female genital mutilation. This is an issue that is in between health and rights of women and girls. And unfortunately, Mr. President, in several countries in the continent, we are seeing attempts to revert the law that ban female genital mutilation. And I appeal strongly to the members of parliament that are here. We are available to you with the information, the knowledge, the medical knowledge that is required to truly understand the damage that this phenomenon creates for the future health of young girls and the future health of women. The fistula, the infertility, the problem during pregnancy that are caused by these practices that unfortunately is being trying to revert. So, 
With those words, Mr. President, I thank you very much for the opportunity to address all of you, and we remain available for the discussion and the conversation. We work with the Interparliamentary Union for many, many years, and we have contacts with many of you. So please don't hesitate. We are at your disposal with the knowledge, the mobilization of partners, the healthcare professional, the community leaders, the young people that work in our alliance. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Mr. President. Thank you for your statement. Thank you very much. Next on our list is the representative of the International Development Law Organization. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. As this is the first time that the International Development Law Organization has participated in the IPU Assembly, let me extend our thanks to the IPU and its members for granting us observer status and for welcoming us to these important discussions. For those not familiar with IDLO, we are the only global intergovernmental organization devoted exclusively to promoting the rule of law to advance peace and sustainable development. For the 40 years of its existence and through work in over 90 countries, IDLO has seen the benefits of investing in the institutions of governance and of putting people and their needs at the center of justice. Every day, we are witnessing the rise of authoritarianism, human rights violations, and the deepening of social and economic inequalities. Coupled with challenges such as climate change, health emergencies, and food insecurity, these conditions are increasingly driving communities into disputes. Rule of law solutions, such as eliminating discriminatory laws and policies, strengthening institutions, improving access to justice, and empowering citizens to claim their rights can play a key role in addressing the root causes of existing conflicts and preventing new ones. While IDLA works top-down with governments and bottom-up with communities, we are particularly keen to enhance our relationships with parliaments as critical actors bridging these two approaches. There are many areas of IDLO's work for which we believe partnerships with parliaments would greatly benefit. Let me cite just a few. First, overcoming the justice gap for women and girls is critical if we are to overcome current global challenges. IDLO supports governments to conduct comprehensive legal assessments identifying discriminatory laws and practices. We would welcome engagement with parliaments to improve legal frameworks that allow women and girls to fully contribute to development outcomes, governance, and meeting communities' needs. Second is the improvement of justice delivery. IDLO's programs help strengthen judiciaries, such as through anti-corruption and capacity building initiatives, and create pathways for people to resolve disputes before they become violent conflicts, be it through formal or customary and informal justice mechanisms. Parliamentarians have close connections with communities and community leaders that can help improve people's access to and experience with justice and with governance institutions. We welcome your collaboration to achieve that goal. Third, sustainable development requires the right national legal frameworks to promote investment, improve food security, or implement health regulations. IDLO would like to expand partnerships in these areas. I've offered just a sampling of the many ways we can collaborate to advance sustainable development, peace, and understanding. We look forward to working with all of you to achieve those goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move on. Next is the Parliamentary Assembly of La Francophonie. Distinguished representative, you have the floor. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, parliamentarians, dear colleagues, 
The Francophonie is far more than an institutional system based on sharing a common language. We share a set of values and principles that unite Francophone countries in their common quest for greater cooperation and development. In the current context, where you see uh, global challenges, our main objective is to strengthen the model of governance in our countries, to promote democracy, the rule of law, and transparent and accountable governments. We try to create an environment conducive to socio and economic and cultural development in French speaking countries. More than 50 years after, or almost 50 years after the end of the, the Cold War, we see a different confrontation between political models. And it's yet even stronger, perhaps, than it was before. And you see uh, confrontations between democratic, liberal systems and authoritarian systems, on the other hand. And this is affecting all areas of international relations, international trade and global security, um, which is giving rise to new challenges that we all must face. Since it was created in 1967, the Parliamentary Assembly of La Francophonie has been guided by values based on solidarity, respect, cultural and linguistic diversity. We try to promote human rights. These are values that are very much entrenched in the values of Francophone countries and they've been strengthened by aspirations to self-determination and struggles for independence. As parliamentarians, we have a duty to continue to promote these values that we all share and to give them a tangible meaning adapted to the realities of today's world. Because to quote Leopold Senghor in 1966, he said that the representatives of peoples are responsible for pushing governments forward. A growing number of people, including young people especially, no longer see these uh, democratic principles in action because, unfortunately, governments are no longer responding to their aspirations. We hear uh, populist speech, simplistic answers, which try and pretend to solve the world's problems. Africa continues to be badly hit by challenges uh, for socio and economic development. We are seeing a series of acute crises in uh, Francophone countries in Africa with uh, military coups, uh, the overthrow of uh, democratic elected parliaments, as we saw last uh, summer in Niger and Gabon. This has undermined trust in democratic institutions. And we are seeing an increasing number of armed conflicts between states and involving extremist groups. And it's always the poorest and the weakest that suffer, in particular women and children. In this context, parliamentary diplomacy must step forward, step up to the plate, and draw on the potential of dialogue among peers. because um, it is all the more legitimate 
because uh, we are the representatives of our peoples. In our strategy 2023-2030, the Parliamentary Assembly of La, Pro La Francophonie has ensured that parliamentary diplomacy is one of its top priorities. And we try to support that with a determination to have democratic control monitoring mechanisms, regimes of sanctions uh, as well for our members when the constitutional order of their countries has been overthrown and when their parliaments have been dissolved. We have been undertaking uh, reforms. Uh, in June, in our parliamentary assembly, we've adopted a new regime uh, of measures to support transitions, to undertake uh, deep dialogues with the transitional authorities and parliamentary bodies. We need to accept that the coups that we have seen in African countries in recent years are very diverse in nature and the transitional authorities are credible to different extents in their attempts to get back to the normal constitutional order. Could you please conclude, says the chair. Uh, I'm, I'm concluding. We need to have free and transparent elections in Gabon, for example. The transition has been uh, set in motion by a peaceful coup. And the interim government seems determined to organize uh, a return to the constitutional order as quickly as possible. And uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of La Francophonie has uh, been involved to try to encourage uh, the uh, economic community of uh, Central Africa to alleviate the sanctions being imposed on Gabon. And we welcome the fact that a good decision has been taken in that respect. And nevertheless, all transitions uh, must be monitored closely in all of these countries so that uh, democratic institutions can return as quickly as possible. Parliamentary diplomacy must play its role with determination and pragmatism with a view to promoting peaceful cohesion between and among peoples. And if possible, leading to more effective conflict resolution mechanisms. So allow me to congratulate the IPU on the choice of the theme for the debate, parliamentary diplomacy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> and that's it, the representative of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO. You have the floor. I know we are in between lunch. Our time is getting limited, but I want to, to finish those who are on the list so that we can go for lunch happily. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, honorable delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by thanking the IPU Secretary General for inviting the United Nations Industrial Development Organization to take part in IPU's 148 assembly. We are honored to have the opportunity to follow the Assembly's proceedings and learn more about the great work that you do worldwide. UNIDO is the specialized agency of the United Nations with a mandate to promote inclusive and sustainable industrial development in developing countries and economies in transition. Last year, the executive heads of the IPU and UNIDO met and expressed their strong commitment to strengthen the IPU-UNIDO partnership with a focus on two main thematic priorities, climate action and combating 
child labour by consolidating our respective work on the Sustainable Development Goals, the aim is to tackle child labour and climate change through rendering supply chains more sustainable. At UNIDO, we promote and support fair and sustainable supply chains as a major step against child labour and the exploitation of people and nature. And we are working to reshape them into more resilient and sustainable ones, creating local value addition and more equitable opportunities for all. In terms of climate action, UNIDO's focus is on ensuring access to clean and renewable energy for all, on decarbonizing heavy industry to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, promoting energy efficiency, innovation, including for green hydrogen solutions and technology transfer our main areas of work. We recognize the importance of addressing climate and environmental challenges through united action and partnerships to safeguard the planet for future generations. In this regard, UNIDO welcomes and applauds the draft resolution on partnerships for climate action, promoting access to affordable green energy and ensuring innovation, responsibility and equity, proposed by the IPU Standing Com Committee on Sustainable Develop on Development. We are eager to support this initiative. UNIDO fully appreciates the pivotal role of the Interparliamentary Union and the importance of national parliamentary action in shaping an equitable and sustainable future. We look forward to strengthening our partnership and explore ways to join forces to have positive impact towards more sustainable and environmentally friendly societies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your statement. And next on our list is the representative of the Sovereign Order of Malta. You have the floor. Followed by Kopec. And it's going to be our last speaker um, in that order. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Honorable speakers and members of Parliament, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, at the outset, allow me to congratulate the new IPU President, the Honorable Dr. Axon, on her election and extend our deep gratitude to her predecessor, President Pacheco. The Sovereign Order of Malta was admitted as permanent observer at the Interparliamentary Inter Union in 2001, recognizing our long-standing and excellent cooperation on issues of mutual interest, such as human rights, peace and security, climate change, and interfaith dialogue. Since then, we have increased our cooperation and were actively involved in the preparatory process leading to the first parliamentary conference on interfaith dialogue held last June in Marrakesh. I had the honor of moderating a panel entitled Different Mandates, Common Goals, Religious Actors and Parliamentarians as Allies for Promoting Gender Equality and Youth Participation. It truly highlighted the importance of the contribution of religious leaders and faith-based organizations to parliamentary work and the need to expand this collaboration. The fact that the parliamentarians pre present here today, representing their constitu constituents from all over the world with different backgrounds, faiths, cultures, and ethnicities, are working together and with numerous stakeholders clearly reflects the theme of this general debate, parliamentary diplomacy building bridges for peace and understanding. This is why parliamentary diplomacy must not be overlooked but increased, especially at the international level, bringing the voices of every member of our societies to foster peaceful coexistence and mutual understanding, promote tolerance, and fight against discrimination, hatred, violence, and extremism. In that context, the collaboration with faith-based organizations is crucial to achieve those goals for interfaith dialogue and faith literacy. The Order of Malta advocates in its worldwide diplomatic and humanitarian action for the promotion and respect of international human rights and humanitarian law. We strongly believe that the 
input of parliaments in UN processes such as the Human Rights Council and its universal periodic review is an essential element to achieve progress and ensure implementation. We encourage parliaments to share with their respective governments best practices for the benefit of their citizens. In concluding, the Order of Malta looks forward to participating in the next assembly and continuing to work with IPU, in particular on the second parliamentary conference on interfaith dialogue to be held in Rome in 2025. I thank you. Thank you for your statement and thank you for being so brief. Um, last but not least, the representative of the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruptions. Colleague, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, Speaker, Vice Speaker of the IPU Member Parliament, Honorable Delegates, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may peace be upon us all. This theme of this general debate, uh, parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding is timely as we see bullets shot at, bombs drop on, and missiles launch into numerous conflict parts of the world on an everyday basis, often at the stake of civilian lives. Govac believes that war, conflict, violence, and corruption are a cause to each other. I recall the last assembly, Govac said that in the absence of peace, war and conflicts have become an arena where people with power can exercise their authority unchecked. Honorable delegates, too much uh, secrecy can allow corruption to run rife. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute estimates the total value of the global armed trade was at least 127 billion US dollar in 2021, compared with 95 billion in 2012. The total value of the arms trade in 2021 was above 0.5% of the total value of global interna international trade in the same year. Corruption in this sector can lead to compromise or poor intelligence, risking large amount of waste resources, security failures, and frontline security providers. At its worst, corruption within this sector can lead to human rights violation and suppression of liberties. To address that, we need a strong parliament that could provide a clear, impartial, unbiased judgment of balance, accountability, and secrecy in the security sectors. Parliament should also be equipped with adequate knowledge and resources on corruption and human rights interplay, as this issue often become tangled part of wars and conflicts. GOPEC responded to such capacity development through several, several programs, including our last workshop on anti-corruption and human rights for parliamentarians, which was held as a joint program with the UN Institute for Training and Research. Through the program, parliamentarians share and explore the link between corruption and human rights violation and abuses. These inter-parliamentary institution efforts coupled with how parliamentarians across all continents interact, showcase how parliamentary diplomacy could serve as a means to strengthen capacity and dialogue. Delegates, dear ladies and gentlemen, dialogue is the root measure for addressing conflicts. We cannot end the war with another war. All should end at the negotiation table. For that to happen, Parliament should also be vigilant in overseeing security sector and make effective control of the international arms trade a higher priority of our agenda. I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we now have come to the end of our sitting for this morning. We break for lunch, and we expect to be back to continue the work at 2.30. It has been a great pleasure for me to serve in this capacity. I enjoyed listening to each and every one. 
Have a wonderful lunch. Thank you. And, uh, and of course, thank you for men and women who are interpreting and facilitating our work. Uh, their contribution is always highly valued. We thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>